That's how the meeting works. If you want to be heard or speak, you just put up your hand and we'll keep track in order. And I see the hands. If you get disconnected from the call in any way, we'll wait for you for a few minutes, but because we have quorum, we will continue without you. If you're not back in, in 10 minutes, um, I don't think there's anything else. I think we're pretty familiar with the process. At this point, we'll go to number one on the agenda, please. Taking of attendance, Councillor Wheat. Present. Councillor McAlpine. Present. Councillor Ferrier is not going to be here. Councillor Howes. Present. Councillor Bell. Present. Councillor Pierce. Present. Councillor Chambers. Right here. Councillor Miller. Present. Councillor Coleman. Here. Councillor Gatward. Present. Approval of the agenda, please. Number two, Councillor McAlpine. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Bell that the County of Brant Council agenda for December 1st, 2020 be approved. Uh, is there any additions to the agenda before we begin? Seeing none. I have a motion to accept the agenda oh, as it Mayor. sits. Oh, Councillor Gatwick. Mr. Mayor, I have my hand. Oh, Thank I'm you, sorry. Mr. Mayor. I have one item. I have one item under other business. Okay. Do you want to tell us what it is or okay? Um, uh, anything else? It's regarding. Councillor Gatwood, we I can't hear you. You keep cutting out. Can you? I don't have anything again? else. Just, I I don't have anything else. Just one question. Okay, thank you. Uh, vote to approve the agenda as it stands. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Declaration of pecuniary interests. None. Thank you. Delegations, I don't see any. Number five, we'll go right on to planning ap ap applications, please. Uh, Matt, do you want to speak to what we're going to hear about tonight? Yes, thanks very much. Tonight we'll be hearing from staff regarding three forms of reports. The first, Planning Act applications. Initial public meeting presentations will focus on new planning applications that have been received and are being presented to council with the intent to provide information about and receive public input on the application. The second, Planning Act application statutory public hearings will focus on planning reports with staff recommendations for applications that have either been presented to council before as information or are exempt from the initial presentation process. The third set of reports will focus on county initiated planning policy projects in, uh, to be received as information in seeking support of the associated work plans and timelines. Tonight, there are two initial public meeting presentations four statutory public hearings and three policy related project reports for council's consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone's clear. Any questions on what we're going to be doing tonight? Seeing none, we'll move on to 5A, please. Amanda. Thank you, through the mayor. The purpose of this application is to rezone the subject lands with a site specific provision to allow for an aggregate recycling facility, which will also include occasional crushing. The recycling and crushing is processing material from various sites for use on other sites by the applicant and is not intended to be sold on this property. It is staff's understanding the proposed aggregate recycling facility is located at the southern portion of in the on the southern portion of the property. Staff do know the proposed building will be subject to site plan control. The subject lands are designated as employment, which contemplates for heavy industrial uses. The subject lands are also located within the primary urban, urban settlement area and site specific policy area 16, which speaks to priority employment areas. The subject lands are zoned heavy industrial and permitted uses align with an aggregate recycling facility. Staff have circulated a request for comments and will be bringing forward a recommendation report in the new year. Staff can answer any questions the committee and uh, the council may have. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any, any questions for staff before we go to the delegate? Councillor Miller? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, one at the moment, um, three to Amanda, you mentioned it'll go through site plan. Um, at this point, do you know if this crusher, are they intending to put it indoors or keep it outside? 
Uh, thank mm -hmm. you, through the mayor. Um, I would direct that that question actually to the agent who is ready to do a presentation as well. Okay. All right. I'll leave it till then. Thanks. All right. So, Madam Clerk, we obviously have someone here speaking to the application. Yep, we have Dave Austin from MHBC who's speaking on behalf of the agent. Hi, welcome, Dave. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bailey. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I can share my screen for a presentation or how to do that. Heather's nodding oh. that she knows how to do that. There you go. Can you see oh. it? Uh, no, I can see you and I. Oh, there I am. Heather? Something's not working. I, I think you just need to minimize that screen. You had the other screen behind it. Oh, okay. Oh. All right. I apologize here. Unless Let me figure this out. Do we have this? I'm not sure. Did you send us a presentation? Yes, I, uh, I, I thought that I did. Heather? I have it here, but it keeps showing myself and uh, and then a black screen so i i apologize um why don't i just go ahead uh with um with the presentation without the images because i think staff had, have done a good job uh with the proposal yeah, and we, um, we we have we have diag we have the your presentation in front of us too okay um oh. i don't know if that worked mm. I'm thinking it didn't no. work. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, members of council. I'll just go ahead. Um, so the application, as mentioned, is to allow for the additional use for the crushing of aggregate, and the uh, temporary uh, use, and it will be a temporary use, um, uh, as it relates uh, to the crushing. And the the location of the facility is such that it's to the rear of the site and uh, location has been selected for various reasons uh, primarily making sure that it is screened and also um, uh, separated uh, from any surrounding land uses so the temporary crushing and stockpiling, as I mentioned, will be to the rear of the site and the equipment and uh, access will continue via the existing access onto Paris Road. Uh, we've taken a look at separation distance and um, the location of the proposed uh, temporary crushing facility is well in excess of uh, of 100 meters uh, uh, to any uh, adjacent use. Actually, there's only one use that uh, is existing on the south side of the CN rail that's existing industrial. Uh, the residential uses are primarily located a significant distance from the site, uh, more to the intersection of uh, Paris Road and Oak Park Road. So the location provides for uh, one that uh, is, is, is well uh, beyond any distance where there would be uh, noise or, or uh, odor or dust impacts. And as part of the application, um, a stationary noise study and traffic impact study and planning report uh, were submitted and the stationary noise study and traffic impact study uh, as completed did not identify uh, any uh, concerns or issues associated with the application. And from a policy framework perspective, again, as identified by uh, staff, uh, it's designated employment uh, with the site specific area, the use, uh, the uses in this area permit heavy industrial use, uses 
and the amendment is, uh, is required to add the aggregate recycling and crushing activities as as the permitted use. The crushing operation uh, will be an outdoor activity, so it will not be located within a building. Um, and that's our presentation for this evening. We believe that it supports uh, the objectives of the official plan and that the addition of the use is compliant with the NPC 300 uh, noise guidelines for environmental noise. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dave. Uh, does that answer your question, Councillor Miller? Yeah, it does, uh, um, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I, although I will, since I'm on the line, um, could, could, could we talk a little bit about dust? Do we know how much dust it's going to kick up? Yeah. Dave? Uh, I think as as far as dust, I'm not an expert as it relates to dust, but the uh, the activity, as I mentioned, would will be temporary, uh, and it's well located from any residential with you know it's, uh, and, and screened, um, and the nature of the use won't be such that it's ongoing every day all day. Um, it will be. Uh, it will be used on the as needed basis. So it won't, there won't be a continuous uh, 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 dust issue um, with the operation. Thank you. Councillor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to um, the delegation. Um, you mentioned 100 meters was the nearest um, property that would be close to this. In my diagrams and sketches, it looks like farmland surrounds this heavy industrial lot, although there's a commercial property um, next door. Is that the one where you're 100 meters away? And, and who is that in the commercial property? I can't picture what business is there. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, it, through you, Mr. Mayor, I don't know what the business is. The 100 meters, I just wanted to reference because that's where we find uh, the next actual operation and it fronts on to Powerline Road. Uh, and, and the councillor is correct that anything else within 100 meters is, is farmland and the nearest residential, um, I would suggest just estimating the dimensions that we have here would be uh, somewhere in the ballpark of 500 meters um, uh, to the residential on Paris Road. 500 meters. Thank you. Councillor Councillor Bell, did you have a question? I did, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to really to answer one of the questions that just was made, my, my recall from when I was on Committee of Adjustment uh, that there was going to be a gas station in either to the left or to the right of the location mm. that we're discussing today. Uh, there is a sign in the in the field that, that points to it. It's a Pioneer gas station. Uh, I did have one question, though, if I may, uh, to the presenter. And you, you've used the word temporary. Um, is this a, an operation that will disappear after a short time? Um, I, I think through the mayor to Councillor Bell, uh, temporary in the sense that it will be used on a on an as needed basis. Um, I'm, I would have to confirm whether there's any intent that the use actually um, kind of discontinues at some point in time. Um, but at this point, it's uh, uh, temporary in the context of. Um, it, it could come in and it could go out uh, of the site and then be used, um, you know, some days during during the week and some. So there's some weeks it may not even be used. So that's um, what we were intending as the uh, reference to temporary. So you, you mean intermittent rather than temporary? Yes, th that would be uh, good as well. Thank you. Councillor Pierce, you're next, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, so a couple quick questions here. You're saying that um, you say it's gonna be used a few times a year for three to five days at a time. So as far as bringing the 
um, the asphalt and concrete on site. Um, like, are we talking 18 wheel trucks? How many trucks are, are there going to be a day? Do we have any indication of that? Or will it be weekly or monthly? How is that going? How is this stuff going to get on site? Um, I'd have to confirm the number of trucks that was in our traffic study, and I don't have that uh, uh, right in front of me right now, but it would come in uh, through dump trucks uh, onto the site and be stockpiled on site uh, and then used. So I'm not sure the daily activity of trucks, um, but I know uh, that we do have that within the, the traffic study that I could dig up or at least certainly make sure uh, that we have the details as we come forward um, for for our next discussion. Okay, and can I get a little bit more clarification on a few times a year? Are we talking once or twice or once a month or like what's what does a few times mean? The the use of the crushing facility. Yes. Yeah, I'm. I think the use of that facility would be. Um, uh, I, I don't know exactly what a few times a year would mean as far as uh, when they would uh, have the in, enough material stockpiled to to run the operation. Um, I just know that the intent is not that it's an ongoing uh, use of the, the crushing um, um, equipment. And the crushing will be through the, sorry, Mr. Mayor, through you, the crushing will be done through the week or weekends? The crushing would be done, in my understanding, through the week and uh, any other typical uh, county uh, noise study requirements associated with operations would apply. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, Heather, is there anyone here from the public that wants to? Yep, speak? we have a Mr. Sohan Kensal and his architect John Owen are here to speak together. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Hi, this is Sohan Kensal. I'm not sure who John is there. John. I'm here. Yes. Okay, John, you want to say something? If I could, sure. Sure. Go ahead, uh, Madam Clerk, through you to, to Mr. Mayor and members of council and staff. Good evening. My name is John Owen. The pleasure to represent Northfield Developments tonight. And um, this project we worked on to just the east, actually it's immediately to the east of the subject site, has been under uh, work now for over two, two and a half years, working with uh, the staff and county and um, making sure that we're developing it properly. And uh, our client has a best interest uh, with uh, the work that's been invested so far. And I can assure you that this will, this development, if it goes through and if you have the, the um, if you do have approval through your, your office and your authority, that certainly will be um, adversely um, affecting our property or, or Northfield's property. Uh, the reason for that, I've been in business for 30, 43 years and we specialize in industrial and commercial operations for gas stations, planing mills, uh, recycling plants. So we also have experience with excavation and material being brought to sites. And things have changed a lot in the last uh, five or 10 years with the environment and such. So What's, what happens is that this material that comes into these crushers, um, they, they come from a variety of, of operations, from old buildings to cleanups to tearing up roads, you name it, and they bring it in to crush it. That's the name of the game when we understand that. But the challenge is, is the byproducts. Uh, take asphalt, for example, and that's crushed up, and it, you have a rain on it, which we can't control from the sky. It starts to release some of the, the bitumen and all the rest of it. So there's immediate environmental concerns that we have to address collectively. Besides that, the, you really have to identify the donor sites. Like when we develop a property we need to fill, we have to have a geotech engineer certify the donor property, have samples and verify the quality of that soil, and then also have tickets generated and control that dumping at the new site where it's being dropped off at. So crushing operations often do not have that kind of control. So that's, a, that's an environmental concern that strikes me off the top of my head. Uh, second is that the uh, it's the noise, and I know we have acoustical engineers that we use out of uh, in, uh, in, in Markham that um, do all our work for us, and you have to have a target to do the, uh, in other words, the, you have to go and have an engineer look at a crushing operation at the worst condition when they're open up wide and they're crushing bigger materials like concrete or even large stones. Uh, we work with gravel pits as well and had a similar problem. So when they open up at full speed to do the crushing of a bigger material, 
they not just whine, they, they generate a horrendous amount of noise. And that, that space separation that's required travels across open fields very quickly. And we are an open field basically to the, to the east. So we're concerned that we have to get, uh, obviously you'd have to have acoustical reports done by professional engineers who are in the industry, but it's the target that they have to look at of similar operations to the size and nature of that, of that crushing device. So they have a target, they'll have that, that decibel level, and then they have to look at on site where it's gonna be proposed on a new site to see what those distances actually are. And we're immediately adjacent to that property. I'm not sure where it's being located on the property, but that would be a major concern for a uh, operation that's being proposed as the first phase of development for that bigger site as a gas station and a drive-through coffee offering with a very small uh, food partner. But um, that would hurt that would adversely affect the business, I'm sure. Um, so that's the, that's the second one. So first was a pollution issue of the environment. The second is the noise and uh, the dust. The dust, depending on again what's, what's crushing, um, can be horrendous. And depending on the wind, and we're to the, we're to the east, so we're getting the wind from the prevailing winds from the west. And I think that would be a challenge as well for vehicles or parking, you name it, uh, coming through to get gas and um, perhaps... Uh, a bite deep through a fast food, food food partner. So those are the, the concerns I've got. And uh, I think it, again, seeing we're, we're already invested in time and energy here that we, we would hope we get consideration that you, you, you will consider that I'm sure in your wisdom, but I think it's a major concern that uh, should be addressed. And I'm concerned with for my client for eventual continuity and sustainability of his business. And for the second phase that we're working on as well, uh, for that property, which would be retail commercial units and that sort of thing. So those uses are, are, are viable for this corridor. And what we've heard from the county all the way through this process is this is a, a major uh, corridor for business for, for Brantford. And I think, I think that's important to take into consideration as well, cleaning things up, making it more palatable. Wider roads are being put in, proper entrances. This is in a state of flux for development, and I think it needs to be done in that light, and I think the industrial uses they have there are fine, but it's a real stretch to have the, the um, control, from my experience, of what's coming in, when it's coming in, and the idea of this temporary aspect of the uh, of the business, that's going to be really hard to control. And I think that it'd be once it starts, and if it says it is successful, it'll be very busy. I be happy to answer any questions that you have. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Owen, uh, Councillor Gatward first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to um, the delegation. So the, just to be clear then, your concern about the asphalt recycling on the site is the byproducts that leach from recycled asphalt, such as petroleum, will get in the ground and you have to do testing at a gas station to make sure nothing is leaching in the ground from the gas station, but the crushing operation doesn't have to do those same tests to prove where it might be coming from. Is that what you were getting at? No, I, I, to answer your question though, basically we do pre-testing the soil and then we also, during construction, we'll install monitoring wells. So we're constantly monitoring the, the soil as well. All the tanks for underground storage for fuels, of course, are double walled, they're vacuumed. They're always monitored as well these days. So from an environmental point of view, the, the, the gas station is very safe, but we can monitor it as well. My concern about the incoming product is that where it comes from and the unknown from one load to the next. And it's not just with the asphalt with the petroleum that I've seen challenges with. It's uh, concrete block walls that uh, have paint on them. Um, there's a number of different aspects of debris that come associated with knocking down a building. And no one's on, I can guarantee you, no one's on site handpicking or spending an awful lot of labor sorting out clean <laughs> material to be crushed. So you're going to have, pardon the, the, the phrase, but you have a dog's breakfast in terms of the quality and the materials coming through. And every load could be different. And that, that's the concern. Like we're on the, we knock buildings down as well. So we're cognizant of what goes on on site and where it's got to go to, whether it be soil remediation or if it's going to be crushed or whatever. So, but I know the crushers 
they do make a lot of noise and that's that's one of the big problems and if it's dry and a bit of wind you're going to get dust spreading across the property line for sure thank you are there any other questions or concerns seeing none Councillor Bell? Yeah, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Howes that the presentations made for application ZBA 35 slash 20 slash AW from GEDCO, the property located at 485 Paris Road, be received as information and referred to staff for further analysis. Thank you. Everyone's clear on what they're voting on? All the vote, all those in favor? Opposed? And Carrie, thank you very much. Thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you. Five uh, B, please. Who's going to speak to that? Kayla. Um, this is a zoning amendment application prepared by MHBC on uh, behalf of uh, the, the owner of the subject lands for Six Maple Ave in Burford. The lands front onto the east side of Maple Ave and have an area of an approximately uh, 4.14 acres. The lands contain an existing uh, building which is formerly used as a school um, and they have been vacant for many years. The subject lands are designated urban residential and located within the secondary urban settlement boundary. The lands are currently zoned uh, for suburban residential uses which primarily permits single detached dwellings. The surrounding land uses um, are residential open space and commercial, which is located further um, to the south along King Street. So the proposal um, is for a zone change from suburban residential to a RM3 zone, which is residential medium high density. Um, and at this time, it includes a uh, two low story uh, low rise residential apartment buildings, which would be three stories in height and having a total of 80 units. As part of the review, planning staff will be considering the following items. Uh, so we'll be looking at the density and compatibility. We'll be looking at stormwater management, functional servicing and water treatment. We'll be looking at servicing, uh, grading, geotechnical, traffic and lighting. So in terms of the next steps for this application, uh, the application is currently being circulated to um, the applicable staff and commenting agencies. The um, servicing for these lands will be uh, definitely a big topic, um, especially as we know there is a class EA underway for servicing um, and storm water in Burford. Um, there has been uh, significant feedback from the community on this proposal. Um, and so based on this feedback from the local community, we are suggesting that a public engagement session uh, be arranged by the agent in the new year. Um, and this is going to ensure that we have additional consultation with the community. Um, and then again, we will um, notify uh, the public of the public hearing and that will be circulated to the landowners and staff will bring forward a recommendation uh, report and uh, decision by the committee in the new year. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Are there any questions for the for staff, Kayla? Councillor Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, uh, through you to uh, Kayla, you mentioned uh, that you were going to be looking at uh, compatibility issues. Can you just expand on that a little bit? What uh, what we look at when we look at compatibility? Uh, through the mayor to uh, councillor, yes. So in terms of compatibility, we'll just be looking at um, sort of the surrounding uh, land uses. So um, some things such as height um, will be looked at for the proposed building. We'll consider um, height of the surrounding properties as well. Um, we'll look at density um, and, and kind of look at how that fits into the character of the neighborhood. So um, there'll be different ways that we would evaluate um, how compatible it would be. Um, and that's something that we look at through um, design as well as a site plan um, stage. Thank you. Councillor Gatward, you're next, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Kayla, you mentioned um, you would look at the functional servicing. 
and water treatment. Well, um, we know that there's no servicing in Burford and are they proposing a communal well or communal septic system? Do you know that? Uh, so through the mayor to uh, Councillor Gatwood, at this time, the uh, the servicing proposed is private servicing. So they're looking at a on-site water treatment plan and a tertiary uh, system is currently proposed. Um, staff will be discussing um, potential for uh, additional servicing options for the site um, as the Class EA uh, process takes place for Burford. You okay with that answer, Councillor Gatward? So an on-site water treatment plant. Was that indicated on the plan somewhere? It was kind of hard to read the small print. Where is that located? Through the mayor to Councillor Gatwood, um, the, the servicing, the private servicing is proposed at the rear of the property. Um, it may not be um, clear on the plans as it is subject yet to change, um, but the, um, the agent for the application is also um, available to speak to um, that. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I'll declare the public meeting open and I'll ask the, Heather, is there, Dave's here to speak to this. Oh, Councillor Chambers, before we begin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just uh, again, through Kayla, looking at uh, your report, you uh, highlighted uh, several uh, parts of your report in bold letters, uh, two or three or four of them. Uh, I'm just wondering if, if you could uh, just highlight uh, the bold areas because uh, in, I think you're trying to draw the attention that it's, it's either not consistent or not compliant with uh, one policy or another. And there's two or three or four of them there. I'm wondering if you could just highlight those uh, parts of your report briefly. Kayla, do you have? Uh, through the mayor to a uh, counselor, there is no specific reason for the um, the highlighting or the bold. It just may be the format um, of the uh, the presentation. Okay, just specifically and, and for example, uh, you at least in my report, it, it, the bold print. One of the things says this application to move it to permit development on partial services is not consistent with the policies, the provincial policy. Uh, and there's another one, uh, as you go through your report, uh, the application does not conform to the county of brand official plan. Uh, and actually they're easy to pick out because they're, they're in bold letters. And I, I, just, uh, I, I just wanted to highlight uh, those parts of the report. Actually, I wanted you to highlight those parts of the report. Through the mayor to Councillor Chambers, could you um, let us know which page you're looking at of uh, the report? Okay, there's there's one uh, on page five of sixteen. Actually, there's two bold and bold and things. The application to permit development on partial services is not consistent. Then on the same page, the application is not in conformity underlying with the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe uh, for the following reasons, et, et cetera. Page five of 16. Um, through the mayor to Councillor Chambers, I'm just, I'm just wondering if um, there's a little confusion with an, uh, an upcoming report, because this, this is just an information presentation. There, Technically, should be no policy analysis at this at this time. Okay, my apologies. Thank you, Councillor Chambers. Councillor Bell, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to the uh, planners. Uh, two questions: um, Do we have examples elsewhere in the county where we where we move from uh, 
suburban residential to RM3 zoning in unserviced lands? Or are we breaking new ground here? Kayla? Through the mayor to councillor, um, it's my understanding that there may have been um, similar type requests to uh, develop um, this type of density on private servicing, but um, it's my understanding that um, it has not uh, sort of come to fruition. So there's there's no examples that I'm aware of um, that have been built out um, in that sort of method, but uh, definitely um, in Burford, there is the Creekside uh, development um, that has been approved. That I don't think is an RM3 design. I think that, that's, that's not the same designation, I believe. Yeah. Through the Meredith Councillor uh, Bell, yeah, we can look into that and confirm the, uh, the zone for that one for you. Thank you. Just if there's an example that I could look at, understand the issues around, that would be helpful. Second question, what, what is a Moloch? It's on the drawing, the uh, site drawing. Uh, is that some part of a water treatment system? Through the mayor to Councillor Bell, that would just be um, a, a deep garbage disposal uh, system that's proposed. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Gatwood. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I forgot to ask one question earlier. The three-story building that's um, being proposed, do we have a height for that building in feet? 36 feet. Can anyone confirm that Councillor Weed is right at 36 feet? Kayla? Uh through the mayor, if you could just give me one minute, I can look up the um, the height in that zone. Thank you. I don't want the permitted height in the zone. I want to know what the proposed height is of the building. Through the mayor to councillor Gap word. Um, we do not have the exact um, height dimensions at this time. The, uh, the application is uh, dealing just with the zone change. So um, the details of the height will be provided um, at a later stage during the site plan. Um, and the agent could also probably speak to um, the height in more detail as well. Thank you. Okay, we, we have declared the public meeting open. Uh, Dave, you're here to speak on behalf of the application. Yes, I am, and I believe I've figured out how to share the screen. Yes, you have. I think that may be uh, our good friend Adam sharing the screen, but uh, um, Perfect. we can just go from there and I'll let him know when to change the slides. Yeah, thank um, you. So uh, thank you and uh, uh, thank you for those questions. I'll try to answer um, some of them through the presentation because I have some preliminary information that will assist. So uh, this evening, we're, we just want to present uh, some of the background and, and some of the images associated with the proposed development. And here you can see some uh, preliminary renderings of what the three-story uh, buildings uh, would look like. Again, uh, preliminary at this point, but this is generally the intent. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the 1.68 hectare property is proposing the two three-story apartment buildings um, having one and two bedroom units. And, and we understand uh, the um, uh, residential area that uh, Burford is. Uh, we also understand that uh, in areas in the county and uh, really in a lot of the surrounding areas, there's a need to provide a mix and range of different housing choices for people. And that's where we're looking at uh, the apartments, which would be condominium buildings um, uh, that would be available to people as a different housing form uh, within uh, the community of Burford. There's a access to Maple Ave, 
Uh, there's a large amenity area to the rear of the buildings and uh, the parking spaces uh, are identified as required by the bylaw. Next slide, please. So this shows a general conceptual design. The private servicing area is to uh, the east portion of the property adjacent to the existing uh, cemetery boundary. So it's the green area uh, along the east with the, the kind of path running through it. Uh, and then there's the parking area and then the two proposed three-story buildings with an entrance and a design uh, entry into the site that considers uh, a number of things, stormwater management, providing a landscape, the amenity space, and a very visual um, green space as a break between the two proposed buildings. And as you can see, the, the buildings are, are set back from the street. The orientation is such that um, the three uh, story buildings, the two ends of the buildings um, are, you know, in context of uh, trying to locate uh, similar to what a single detached house would be. So rather than uh, uh, massing the buildings along Maple Ave. We looked at uh, massing the buildings in this way to not kind of dominate the street with a, a, a building length wall, but to, pro but to provide a building with some green space and then another building. So a break for the streetscape. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the This is again, preliminary building uh, elevation. Uh, the uh, Existing zoning permits buildings uh, in the height of 10.5 meters. Again, it depends where you measure, if it's a flat roof or a hip roof. Um, what's proposed with these buildings is the height to the eaves, as shown, is uh, approximately 9.3 meters or so, or just over 30 feet. And the height to the peak uh, of the roof is approximately 50 feet uh, or about 15.5 um, meters. So that just gives you some context of, of the height um, and, and where the preliminary elevations are sitting at. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there was a pre-consultation meeting held in 2017 with county staff. Uh, at, uh, an open house was also held in 2017 uh, which involved uh, members of the community uh, um, to, see, to review the plans, uh, renderings, and the site plan at the time. The original proposal had 96 units, and so that uh, was modified since the time of that original uh, pre-consultation. We had a further pre-consultation in May of 2019, and the application was formally submitted in October 2020 uh, with the 80 uh, units. Uh, next slide. And th this, you can see the existing uh, building on the site. Uh, we provided some uh, context of the property. Uh, the, the site we see is being um, located in a way that you, know, you could walk to the downtown, uh, walk to the amenities uh, within the community. So we see it as a good opportunity to uh, provide for infill and intensification in Burford and provide that uh, mix of additional housing choice in the community. Next slide. Uh, from a policy framework perspective, uh, designated urban residential in the official plan with a maximum permitted density of 50 units per hectare. Uh, for medium density residential. So we're, we're respecting uh, the requirements of the official plan and uh, the use uh, would be a permitted use under the official plan policies. And the change that needs to occur is uh, from the suburban residential to the RM3 uh, to facilitate the proposed uh, type of use as an apartment use. Uh, next slide. Um, as far as studies completed and submitted, uh, the uh, typical studies, uh, with the exception of 
the tertiary treatment design report and uh, the you know the hydrogeological and geotechnical reports having a, having more focus on uh, the considerations associated with the private servicing, uh, traffic impact study, and planning justification report. Next slide. Um, in in our opinion, the proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement and conforms with the growth plan. Both of those uh, speak to um, intensification and and infill. Um, and we do uh, fully respect the comments of staff and the matters that need to be considered in the review of the process. Um, the proposal implements the official plan and the use uh, is permitted in context of, of the density. Um, the current uh, proposal uh, indicates that this that the proposed servicing will, will function. Uh, we have had a number of discussions with county staff on the servicing considerations and the Class EA that's occurring as it's as it relates to the Burford community, and we'll continue those discussions with county staff as we move through the process. And uh, as I mentioned. Uh, in our opinion, the, the type of use that's being proposed will contribute to um, providing a greater range and mix of housing within the community and within the county of Brant. And I think that's uh, my presentation for this evening and happy to answer any questions. Thank, thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions to the presenter? Um, I'll have to get that screen out of my way so I can see who's still here. Uh, one. Let's, there we go. Any, okay, I see Councillor Pierce first, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, so the original you stated was 96 units and now it's down to 80 units. Um, the, the cause or the reason for that is, are the buildings smaller or just less units and they're bigger? How did you get from 96 to 80? What changed? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, through Mayor to you. The uh, floor was reduced uh, to three stories and the number of units came down. So the buildings essentially uh, became smaller. Thank you. Councillor Howes first and then Councillor Gottward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to Dave. Uh, uh, Dave, I, I acknowledge that uh, the, there's a high demand for rental uh, units throughout the county of Brant, and that that will increase. Um, for the benefit of people who might be watching this and and learning about it, um, can you tell us a little bit more about whether these these 80 units are? I don't think they're going to be affordable housing. They would fall under the definition of attainable housing market value. But could you speak a little bit about that and the, the fact that they're condos? Um, um, means that you're 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 looking at kind of long-term renters uh, without a lot of turnover. But could you speak to that, please? Sure. Thank you uh, to the councillor. A um, couple of things there. Yes, you are correct. These will not be uh, affordable housing uh, units in the context of, uh, of defined affordable housing. Uh, the proposal is that the uh, units would become condominium units, which would offer uh, opportunity both for for rental, longer term rental, or home ownership of the unit. Um, and, the con and the condominium then also uh, would relate to, um, you know, the, the maintenance associated with uh, the stormwater management or the, uh, the, the on-site uh, on facilities as well. Councillor Gatward, and then Councillor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to the delegation. Um, you mentioned that there was a hydrogeological report done. And can you tell me, did they do pump tests on that property for water and then determine how many liters per second were available that could serve 80 households? without affecting any neighbors? 
how did they, what did that report tell you? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Gatward. Um, again, I'm not an engineer, so I won't stray too far into uh, the realm of, of the methodology. Um, but with regard to the water servicing, um, the conclusion was that uh, the you know wa water services were available um, to support the development. I'd have to get back to you on the on the details of the testing, and not something that uh, I know. Also, that uh, county staff are having uh, that study peer reviewed. So I think uh, that's that's something that if if we could get some some further detail through the process uh, that probably is the best way. And then we'll also have the benefit of any comments from county staff uh, peer review as well. Yes, thank you for that. Because a lot of people that are in wells are very protective of their wells because a house yes. without water is, is not a good situation. So thank you. Yeah, understood. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Miller, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, three to the delegation. Um, thank you. Uh, we'll say thanks to Councilor Gatward for asking the one question about water. The, then the other follow up to that would be a question about wastewater. Um, I guess you're looking at, or the applicant is looking at a, a new care system, I understand. And this is to be discharged into the ground, I assume? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> given the high nitrates or higher nitrates than probably there should be in the groundwater now. Um, is this going to aggravate that situation? Uh, through Mayor to Councillor Miller, that uh, that is a very specific component that is addressed uh, through the hydrogeological and the tertiary um, uh, system review. And I know it is something that in discussions with county staff, their peer reviewers is, is also looking at. Um, so the information is built into the studies as far as uh, an understanding of the functioning of the system. And then as we move into greater detail, uh, further assessment would occur and be reviewed through the county and any uh, ministry process. So um, that I don't have the exact answer for you because I, I would say that's something that's being reviewed and considered uh, as part of the studies that were submitted. Okay well I hope we have those answers before uh, we see anything from this again at uh, planning. Um, yeah. I do know that there is another proposed development looking at using wanting to use the exam, exact same technology and they seem to be having uh, a heck of a time getting uh, MOECC approval. So I suspect yeah. yours. This uh, I suspect I suspect this uh, uh, proposed development would face the same uh, battle. So given that, given all the issues with that, I, I do have to ask why 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 would why why come forward now? Why not wait till that uh, EA study is done? Uh, through Mayor to Councillor Miller, um, we've had uh, at least two discussions now with county staff on the Class EA. Um, and the application was coming forward uh, really uh, in advance of that Class EA starting. Uh, so we are fully anticipating to be engaged with the county study process and working with the county uh, through that to determine the um, most functional and feasible servicing for Burford. And you know it's, at, it's in its early stages. Uh, the Class EA, and uh, sounds like there's a number of different options, and and one of them could be providing full water and uh, wastewater to the community. In which case, um, uh, this proposal then, you know, for the wastewater uh, private wastewater system would change. So, you know, we understand that that process is going to take a year to 18 months, and uh, we'll just Last earlier, well, it was either yesterday or late last week, we had a discussion with staff in advance of this meeting um, because we wanted to uh, uh, make sure that everyone was aware that our approach uh, right now is to work with county staff and input to that Class EA process and, uh, and, and look for that outcome to come forward 
as input to this application. Okay, I just, there seems to be a few balls in the air and, and from my perspective, this application complicates everything, but that's another matter for not your concern, I guess, at this point. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Are there any thank other you. questions for the applicant? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation today. Heather, are there any people here from the community that want to speak? No, there's no members of the public. All right. Councillor Gatward. Oh, first of all, we'll declare the public meeting closed. Councillor Gatward, you have the resolution? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Miller, that the presentations made regarding application ZBA 38-20KD be received as information and referred to staff for further analysis. Any any questions before we call the vote? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried, thank you. Number six. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt. Thank you. Tonight we'll be considering four Planning Act applications with recommendations for approval. All four applications were presented previously for input and information to inform the staff report. Thank you. Uh, for, no. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, with us uh, tonight is Kayla DeLay, who will be presenting this application for council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this application before us tonight is a zoning amendment for lands located at 526 Scenic Drive in the former township of South Dumfries. The applicant is proposing to rezone the lands from agricultural and natural heritage to rural residential. The application also requests a site specific provision for an increased side yard uh, setback of 10 meters on the west lot. And this is um, specifically related to the MDS setback in order to facilitate two severances. The county has identified a natural heritage system land use designation, and the subject lands are part of this natural heritage designation and contains land, contain lands designated as woodlot and vegetation. Staff are of the opinion that the proposed development will have a significant impact on the woodlands, um, as it is anticipated that hundreds of trees would need to be removed to facilitate the proposed development. Um, this is a significant disturbance to a natural heritage area and woodland. The subject lands are also part of a larger 18 hectare woodlot and the proposed development would further fragment this natural heritage area, including not only the woodlot, but also the wetlands and the significant wildlife habitat, which have been identified through the EIS. It is planning staff's professional opinion that the proposal to develop within a significant woodlot does not represent good planning and is not permitted as per the growth plan. Overall, staff are of the opinion that the proposal is not consistent with the PPS, does not conform to the policies of the growth plan, and the application is not in conformity with the intent of the County of Grant official plan in respect to development in a natural heritage feature. Staff are recommending that this application be refused. Um, and we do have Michelle or Knight. Uh, should have should council have any specific environmental? Seven o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions before we hear from the applicant? Any questions for staff? Seeing none, I'll declare the public meeting open. And Heather, there's someone here, obviously, to speak to the application. Yep, Scott Patterson and Cheryl Ann Ross are here on behalf of the applicants. Welcome, Scott and Cheryl Ann. Good evening, Your Worship, members of Council. Thank you for uh, having us tonight to speak to this matter. I have a PowerPoint presentation to utilize, okay. uh, so I'll start that now if I could. Thank you. There we go. Mr. 
So as you're aware, the proposal is to create two lots that uh, front on the scenic drive from the lands at 526 Scenic Drive. Uh, the portion of the lands to be rezoned for the new lots are currently zoned agricultural and would be changed to rural residential to match the official plan designation. Uh, various materials were submitted in support of the application, including an environmental impact study prepared by Abud and Associates. Uh, the staff report, as you're aware, recommends refusal of the application based on the belief that the project is inconsistent with the PPS, uh, does not conform to the growth plan, and also does not conform to the county official plan. The environmental impact study that was submitted provides a factual, science-based analysis of the property and provides clear support for the proposal to proceed. Uh, as noted in the staff report, where the growth plan is applicable geographically, it will take precedence over the policies of the PPS. And applying the more specific policies of the growth plan satisfies the requirements of the more general policies of the PPS. In this regard, the growth plan is to be utilized for reviewing the proposal. On multiple occasions, we've had discussions with staff and have highlighted policy 4.2.4 of the growth plan uh, which notes the provincial mapping of the natural heritage system for the growth plan does not apply until it has been implemented in the applicable upper or single tier official plan. Until that time, the policies in this plan that refer to the natural heritage system for the growth plan will apply outside settlement areas to the natural heritage systems identified in official plans that were approved and in effect as of July 1st, 2017. The County of Brand official plan was adopted in 2012 and has not been updated to incorporate the growth plan mapping. Uh, staff comments have utilized the growth plan mapping to object to this proposal. However, the mapping is not applicable to the area where the new lots are proposed. Uh, we do believe that the zoning amendment is consistent with the PPS and does comply with the growth plan as the policies and mapping of the growth plan are not yet applicable to this particular area and until such time as the county incorporates the mapping into their official plan. I'm joined tonight by Cheryl Ann Ross, who's the author of the environmental impact study. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to her to walk you through the environmental study that was completed. Thank you, Scott. Hi, Scott, the uh, slides aren't moving forward at all. We're still on the very first slide. Uh, technical difficulty, Mr. <laughs> Mayor. It is moving forward on my computer, naturally. Um, we're still on the very first screen. <laughs> of course. Oh, we have a second screen. All right, now, now I think you're on, you're on slide uh, six now, which would be where I'd be starting. Okay, so um, I'm Cheryl Ann Ross, I'm from Abood and Associates, and I was one of the authors of the EIS, as Scott had stated. So the focus of the EIS is to determine whether or not the area of the proposed lots is provincially significant in terms of woodland. So policy 2.3.2.3.2H of the county official plan notes, if the land identified as woodlands and vegetation is not a provincially significant feature as determined by an environmental impact study, the overriding land use designation and all applicable policies shall apply. On this basis, the EIS determined the area identified as woodland and vegetation was not provincially significant based on the following. You would go to the next slide, Scott, thanks. So the, nat the significant woodland designation is based on the Natural Heritage Reference Manual, which is a guidance document for the creation of policy. It does not define significance, but provides a set of criteria that can be applied for defining significance. The Brant County OP states the significant woodlands will be identified in accordance with criteria recommended by the province, specifically the Natural Heritage Reference Manual, which defines a set of criteria that can be applied for the designation of significant woodlands in Ontario. So some of the benefits of woodlands and why we should be preserving significant woodlands are soil erosion prevention, nutrient cycling, hydrological cycling, flood and erosion reduction, clean air, long-term storage of carbon, wildlife habitat, outdoor recreational activities, and sustainable harvest of woodland products. Woodland products would include things like maple syrup, not the removal of trees. The woodland identified in the severance limits provides limited functionality in these regards. It is a plantation feature that is generally made up of 
red pine and white pine. Red pine does not occur naturally in so southern Ontario. It's a northern species, so would not be considered native to this area. The Natural Heritage Reference Manual identifies the Oh, sorry. Proposed severance is unlikely to significantly impact any of these functions of woodlands. I've included a map that shows the woodland area as well as some of the adjacent lands around. One of the things that has come up numerous times was that there were linkages to this woodland from other woodlands in the area. However, as you can see from some of the measurements on the map, all of these other features are at, are at least 20 meters away and would not be considered a linkage. Also, you can see from the aerial photo that the majority of this woodland feature is made up of a monoculture of plantation features. There are eight criteria that can be used to identify significant woodland under the National Heritage Reference Manual. This includes size, interior habitat, proximity to other significant features, linkages, water protection, diversity, uncommon characteristics, and economic or social value. Of these, this woodland feature met only one, which is size, and more than half of that is plantation, which provides little to no diversity or habitat for wood wildlife or any other uh, ecological benefit. There are wetlands located on the retained property, but all are at least 30 meters away from the proposed severances and would not be impacted by this proposal. We'll move to the next slide, Scott. Dan Isherem also states the woodlots can be considered, considered significant based on size alone. However, it also identifies that the recommended evaluation criteria provide flexibility to accommodate evaluation, sorry, <laughs> to accommodate various situations and consideration of local factors and conditions may result in modification of these criteria. So our study didn't only consider these on an individual basis, but looked at them as a whole. One single criteria should not determine whether a woodland is significant or not, in particular when the woodland is not providing any other benefits or values to the natural heritage. So I've done another little uh, close-up shot here where you can see over the aerial the proposed severance location, which is surrounded by other estate type lots similar to what we are proposing. You can also see that there are large gaps within the woodlot that are existing where trees have likely been removed in the past as a result of the fact that these are plantation features. The feature is also adjacent to a road and would be considered the end of the woodland and not an interior feature, nor would it be providing any linkage function. If anything, it would be providing a linkage to the road and other residential areas where animals are more likely to be hit by cars. Additionally, during our field studies of the lot, no significant wildlife habitat, no habitat for SAR, and no habitat for any amphibians or herptiles was identified within this portion of the property. So in summary, it only meets one of eight criteria of, sig of significance. And these are not policy criteria. These are recommended criteria of the natural heritage. And it is generally up to each county or higher tier municipality to create their own significance criteria and at the moment Brant County does not have this. The woodland is a highly disturbed plantation which the natural heritage identifies can be considered woodland but if it is actively managed would not be considered a woodland. The wooded area to the south of the severances is a continuation of the pine plantation with low diversity and has no significant functions or features. The natural forested area surrounding the wetland to the west is outside of the development footprint and is more than 50 meters from the edge of the nearest severance, and so would not be impacted by the severance. The entire severance is within a plantation community with no identified functions beyond tree cover. Based on our review, our professional opinion is that this woodland should not be considered provincially significant in its present state. Additionally, removal of a portion of the plantation is not expected to impact on the function of the remaining woodlands on the subject property or adjacent areas. Most of the trees to be removed are anthropogenic in nature and were planted, and a significant portion are non-native red pine. There is some evidence of past harvest within the plantation, as can be observed through the significant canopy gaps in areas of regeneration within the plantation. 
Trees to be removed could also be compensated with native species and in areas that can provide significantly greater benefit to the natural heritage functions of the retained property, resulting in no negative impact to the natural heritage feature. I'm sorry, excuse me, there's just one minute left in the presentation, please. Thank you, Heather. I think we're at the end and I'll uh, pass it back to Scott now. So in conclusion, uh, if the woodlands and vegetation are not provincially significant, the natural heritage related policies are not applicable and only the overriding land use designation and all applicable policies are to apply. Uh, this is based on policy 2.3.2.3.2H, uh, which is the real residential land use designation would then apply to the property. If the woodlands and vegetation are provincially significant, which is what staff appear to be suggesting, then development can still occur as per policy 2.3.2.3.2I, which the environmental impact study speaks to and supports. On this basis, we've been asked council to not support the staff recommendation and to instead approve zoning bylaw amendment ZBA 24 slash 20 slash AW on the basis that the environmental impact study clearly supports the proposal. Thank you very much. Uh, before we have questions to the presenter, uh, I, I'm sure, I hope I declared the public meeting open. If I didn't, I will now. Are there any questions to the presenters? Councillor Miller, you're first, please. You, okay, yep. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, through you to the, um, regarding the ecological report, um, they said it only meets the provincially significant um, whatever uh, on one criteria that is size. Um, my question is if we left it long enough, <laughs> would it meet it on other criteria? In other words, over time, we see more uh, native uh, tree species take over like maple and oak. So that, that's my question. Would we, if, if we're having this discussion 20 years hence and there was no development, would we see it become a, you know, provincially significant on more than one criteria? Uh, based on its current status, it's unlikely because it's a densely planted plantation. So there isn't really any room for any native species. There isn't uh, very close by um, seed source for those native species to move into. Any of the woodlands that are around it are further downslope. They're into floodplain and wetter species, which wouldn't be able to survive where the plantation is. Where the plantation is situated is a very sandy soil and is um, higher up versus all around it is more green ash lowland with red maple and those species wouldn't would not likely uh, succeed within the plantation area. Okay I have a university professor in biology that would disagree with you on that one but thank you for your answer. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Councillor Bell and then Councillor McAlpine. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Matt. Uh, through you to the presenters. Uh, can you explain why we're rezoning the piece of land where the existing house is located? Why are we not just proposing to rezone the area that you want to sell up? Uh, through you, Your Worship, to the Councillor. The limits of the rezoning follow the designation limits. So the rezoning line across the property follows the rural residential designation and the official plan. Um, when I originally submitted the applications or the materials to the county for the pre-app, uh, I did only include the new lots that were proposed. Um, through discussions with staff, it was determined that we should include the area of the property that contained the existing house and existing shed uh, back to the dimension into the property that the official plan designation was applicable as well. So this is not then with the intention of further severing another lot to the west and western part of the land we're talking about. Uh, again, through your worship, uh, our original intent was to create an additional lot on the west side of the property. Um, that was hampered by minimum distance separation to the abutting farm and the livestock that's contained thereon. Uh, so the, yes, the original intent was to create another lot in that location, but uh, that was not supportable from an MDS standpoint, so that was abandoned. And would that have anything to do with the uh, uh, feedback we got from the neighbour on the abutting land that, that said the uh, owner of the property at 526 asked that particular neighbour to move his horse to another location? I, again, through your worship, there, there was a discussion between the proponent and that property owner. 
Um, it's my understanding they have one horse and a limited number of chickens. Uh, even with that limited number, the, the setback distance from MDS is significant and precluded the development of that lot on the western side. Uh, so that was a discussion. I was not in attendance, but it was a discussion to see if that property owner uh, would be willing to relocate their livestock and that would support the addition of a, another lot on site. Um, naturally, there's no mechanism to force that property owner to relocate their livestock and that was not our intent. <laughs> But it was just a, a subject or discussion to to see if that was something they were considering or would do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Councillor McAlpine. I was just wondering about the age of the plantation. It sounds like it's um, in good shape at this point. So, the majority of the trees were in around the thirty centimeter DBH range. And when were they planted? I am not sure. I'm not sure when the plantation was planted. So I can just speak to the size of the trees. We didn't get any history or background as to when it was planted. Any other questions? Councillor Bell? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Bell. I think it's probably to our staff because it seems like this whole discussion hinges on whether we believe these are significant woodlands or not. And I would appreciate to hear from the, the staff how they would uh, counter the, the uh, comments from the presenters. Staff want to speak to that? Oh, hello, Michelle. Good evening, everybody. Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Bell, uh, I would like to speak to it. So there are two aspects and there is a definition of a significant woodland. And basically that would take precedence uh, over the guidelines. And it's basically a woodland which is, so it's not can or should. So it says a woodland which is ecologically important in terms of, and it lists a number of features and specifications. And the key wording here is that it uses the wording or quite a few times. So a woodland which is ecologically important in terms of size. Uh, and then as the applicant pointed out, uh, there is a natural heritage reference manual by the Ministry of Natural Resources and it provides guidance on determining what a significant woodland is or is not. Uh, and in terms of the, uh, the reference manual, it looks at where woodland meets any one of the criteria, it should be considered significant. And this is in more than one instance. And when it talks about size, it says, uh, where woodland in our case, uh, because our, our woodland coverage is only at 13%. So if a woodland is four hectares or greater, it should be considered significant. Uh, so on the basis of size alone, it's the opinion of staff that it meets this criteria to be considered significant and the natural heritage reference manual says that it should be. Uh, there also are a number of wetlands. There's also candidate significant wildlife on the subject lands and so there are natural heritage features uh, within and near the woodland, uh, uh, certainly where the whole entirety of the zoning is proposed to be rezoned. Uh, there is candidate wildlife habitat. There's also a wetland in the Northwest corner. And so it is part of a natural heritage system. Uh, so I think it does meet other criteria in terms of being connected and near other features as well. So it's the opinion of staff that it is a significant Woodland based on size alone. Thank you. Any other questions to either staff and or to the presenter? Seeing none, we'll move on. Heather, is there anyone from the community that wants to speak to this application? No, I have no members of the public. Okay. Well, I, I'm very familiar uh, with, with this property. Uh, beautiful, beautiful estate lots on either side of the proposed severances uh, and one across the street. I'm very familiar with the people that live there and uh, being on the property, it would be a shame to see what makes the two properties wonderful be taken away from them, which is the natural buffer between two beautiful estate lots on a beautiful corner in the County of Brant. So um, that's, that's my only comment. Um, seeing no other questions or comments, Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Move by myself, second by Councillor Pierce that the application said BA 24 
slash 20 KD for the property located at 526 Scenic Drive be refused as outlined in the staff report RPT 20-194. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone's clear. No questions. All those in favor of refusal? Opposed? Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Nice to meet you, Cheryl Ann. Nice to meet you. Okay. Next thing on the agenda is 6B. Dan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Dan's just uh, coming in here. If you just give us one minute. We'll be with you. Yep. Next thing on the agenda is 6B. Dan. Oh, I just heard myself again. Hello? Next thing on the agenda is 6B. Dan. Heather, can you hear me? I just heard myself again. Yeah. We can hear you, Mr. Mayor. That's okay. just uh, Mr. Van Porten's. I think he's still got the YouTube playing somewhere. Okay. Dan, are you are you situated now, Dan? I'm comfy. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, Planning staff. Have received a zoning bylaw amendment application from JH Cahoon Engineering on behalf of the owners of 73 and 81 West River Road in Paris. This application was presented to Council in August for information purposes it is being recommended that ZBA 720 slash DN be refused for the reasons outlined in the staff report. The subject lands are located on the north side of West River Road, east of Bailey Drive within the primary urban settlement boundary of Paris. The subject lands are comprised of two, uh, two abutting parcels, uh, rectangular parcels, 73 uh, West River Road, has a frontage of 120, uh, 192 meters, a depth of 125 meters, and an area of approximately 2.4 hectares. 73 West River Road currently contains the existing dwelling and associated accessory structures. 81 West River Road has a frontage of 60 meters, a depth of 80 meters, and approximate area of 0 0.5 hectares. Uh, this parcel is currently vacant. The surrounding land use uses consist of low density residential development to the south and west, agricultural related uses further to the east outside of the settlement area, and an active resource extraction uh, area uh, known as the Dufferin Aggregate Operation. The County of Brand Official Plan identifies the subject lands designated as urban uh, residential land use located within the limits of the primary urban settlement boundary of Paris. The subject lands are currently zoned urban residential. Uh, residential singles R1 within the zoning bylaw, and the residential single R1 zone permits single detached dwellings, grouped homes, and existing duplexes. The subject lands are currently partially serviced by municipal water. As a result of the ongoing review and future development of the 700 plus uh, unit Paris Grand subdivision, Full municipal uh, infrastructure, water, sanitary, and storm will be extended east along Paris Lynx Road towards West River Road. The timeline for the extension of services is unknown at this time as it's dependent on the continued and detailed design review uh, and phasing associated with the plan of subdivision. Paris Master Servicing Plan is currently being developed by GM Blue Plan to establish a preferred strategy for water, sanitary, and stormwater as a response to the rapid growth development in the town of Paris. The goal of the master servicing plan is to ensure that the current servicing needs are met, service uh, levels are increased and available to support uh, growth as well as to uh, improve long-term operational and financial function. The Paris servicing plan is intended to provide servicing strategies for water, sanitary, and stormwater to accommodate the full build-out of the Paris settlement area, including strategies to fully service Paris Graham subdivision and the surrounding area. This Paris master servicing plan, as we know, was accepted by Council on uh, November 17th, a notice of study completion issued, and is currently in the 45-day review period. So. With all that being said, 
this pro this proposal, this application is requesting to amend the zoning bylaw to permit uh, development of the subject lands on partial services on lots requiring a minimum lot frontage of 20 meters uh, and minimum lot area of 1,000 square meters. As outlined in the staff report, the planning analysis focuses on uh, a review of applicable planning policy, including pr uh, provincial policy statement, growth plan, uh, the county official plan, and the zoning bylaw. Constant themes identified in the review of the planning policy include development within the primary urban settlement boundary of Paris shall be on full municipal services existing and or planned. Development within the primary urban settlement boundary of Paris shall be appropriate, efficient, sustainable and compact form of development, avoiding the need for unjustified and or uneconomical ex uh, expansion and use of infrastructure. Development on partial services can be considered on an individual basis where deemed appropriate for infill or minding, minor rounding out of development uh, or as permitted by BALA or agreement to connect when full services are available and development within settlement areas are to avoid land use patterns which may cause environmental or public health and safety concerns. So based on the reasons outlined in the staff report, planning staff are of the opinion that this individual request for development on partial services is not appropriate as the, the proposal is not considered a rounding out or infill. The development of the subject lands as proposed on partial services within the primary urban settlement boundary of Paris is not considered efficient, sustainable, nor compact form of development when considering the availability of planned full municipal services as outlined in the Paris Master Servicing Strategy. This application is not consistent with the policies of the provincial policy statement, does not conform to the growth plan and county of Brant official plan. For these reasons, bank staff are recommending refusal of application ZBA 720DN. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to declare the public meeting open and ask the clerk whether the applicant is here or a representative of the applicant. And I'm assuming uh, that's Rob. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, uh, Rob Van Port and GH Cahoon Engineering Limited. Thank and you. And I see on the screen that the proponents, uh, Mr. Sepp Ruska and Mr. George Huppert, are also available in the Paris uh, office, and they will be making a brief presentation uh in support obviously of, of their application and their uh, development aspirations uh, as pointed out by uh planner Nemizniak, uh our firm represents two property owners on the north side of west river road a 73 west river road which is owned by mr george hubbard um, has an area of 2.37 hectares uh, or 2.4 hectares and on this property is uh, his primary residence as well as outbuildings. Um, 81 West River Road has an area of approximately 0.4 of a hectare, uh, is vacant uh, and, and is um, owned by Mr. Sepp uh, Ruska and his wife. There are no buildings on this property. The subject property in the general area is designated urban residential within the settlement boundary, a primary settlement boundary of Paris. And as pointed out, policies require that residential development occur on full municipal services. This area is serviced by water um, and uh, water only, and uh, there are no uh, municipal sewers available either in the foreseeable future or, um, or, or in the foreseeable future. Um, and we've never been advised, Mr. Mr. Mayor, um, when services would be available. Um, in, in earlier meetings we had with uh, municipal senior municipal staff, uh, we were advised and this was probably about a year and a half ago, we were advised that sewers would be available in a 10 or 20 year time frame, um, which obviously um, caused some concern to the property owners and which precipitated in the submission of this application. Um, the subject property in January is zoned a residential single R1, which requires a development also occur on full municipal services. The submitted rezoning application 
seeks an amendment to the zoning category to allow development on, on partial services and well as establishing development standards uh, of uh, minimum for a single detached house of 20 meter width and a thousand square meter in area. The subject property is located within the extreme eastern boundary of the settlement boundary of Paris within an area of large estate residential properties also on, prop, uh, on partial services. The official plan in section 5.2.3.2 states in A, full county water and municipal or sanitary sewer system shall be required for servicing for primary urban settlement areas. And that was pointed out by the planner. And I'm gonna highlight this area. The clause goes on to say, except in areas designed or designated by the bio to be an area where partial servicing is permitted. The official plan goes on to state in section 5.2.3.2 I, it says in order to ensure the efficient use of land and country and county services development, including lot creation on private systems shall not be permitted in areas with water and um, sanitary sewer sewage systems. However, and I'm highlighting this, however, exceptions may be considered in areas not serviced by county systems on the basis of a site specific amendment to the zoning bylaw and satisfaction of the following criteria. And one is that a master plan has been completed for the municipality, a master water and sewer service master plan has been completed. Uh, the development of the land and accommodation of a private service Serve, servicing system shall not preclude the ultimate extension of the development of the county water and sewage systems. Uh, the topography, soil and environmental characteristics of the land is suitable to accommodate private systems. Uh, for the proposed development is consistent with this plan. And five, and this is most important, the proponent sign a letter of intent stating that if services are eventually extended to the area, the owner of the lot will connect to the service provided and will properly decommission the private services all at his own cost. And the letter of intent, or in this case, probably an agreement, would be registered on title and be transferable from owner to owner. And I might point out, uh, Mr. Mayor and members, that uh, certainly this is not, not something that is unique uh, to this site. Uh, I have uh, done severances before in the county where this was a condition of, of uh, the severance um, because private services were, were not fully available at the time. So the exception format forms the basis of our zoning request and why in our opinion, the request is consistent as envisaged by this council when adopted the current official plan policies in 2012. Although the rezoning application was submitted in February of this year, uh, discussions with municipal staff, municipal planning staff occurred probably a year earlier by myself and certainly earlier than that by the, uh, by the owners. Um, and it was agreed by staff that the area with, will be eventually developed on, or with the eventual development of the golf course, the extension of services would be included, uh, would, be, uh, would be extended. But as I indicated, staff at that time said, it'll be a time frame of 10 to 20 years, which is obviously unreasonable. Um, the current staff report um, in various sections note that the municipal services are planned to be available as the result as a result of the 700 unit development of the Paris uh, Grand Subdivision. But again, there's no time limit uh, placed on that extension. And Mr. Mayor and members, if you know if if we we're talking to one, one year or two years for the extension of the services. I wouldn't be here. We'd be saying, "Great, uh, let's get on with life." And uh, but that's not what we're uh, what we've been led to believe. Um, these properties are dependent on outside influences of both the subdivider and the municipality, depending on economic conditions and and budgets, et cetera, et cetera. 
So the submitted rezoning application seeks such zoning concessions to, to specifically allow the development, future development on partial services. The properties are currently zoned R1, again, requiring services, full services on lots, on residential lots having a minimum area of 360 square meters and a lot frontage of 11 meters. We are proposed to have partially service lots on with a frontage of 20 meters and a area of, of 1,000 square meters. And it's worthwhile noting that this development standard is not unique in this municipality. It's the development standards for the suburban residential zone in areas such as Mount Pleasant and, and uh, Burford. Again, on, on private uh, or partial services. Um, prior to the um, adoption of the current um, comprehensive zoning bylaw, the properties were zoned R1B by bylaw number 110-01, which ironically allowed for partial service residential development on lots having um, a thousand square meters of area and, and 20 square meters of frontage. So prior to uh, 2016, the adoption of the current zoning bylaw, we were in fact allowed to do exactly what we're seeking to do now. Um, I attended most of the public sessions relating to the adoption of the official plan and zoning bylaw. And the recurring theme, as I recall, was we're not going to take use rights away. And by the adoption of the new zoning bylaw, which an official plan, which requires full services in this area, you've done exactly what I believe uh, the municipality was not intending to do. This application there were seek, therefore seeks to reestablish the, the previous zoning provisions that apply to, the, uh, to this property. And the proponents who are in attendance will speak to this in greater detail as, as taxpayers, I'm sure. Uh, in my opinion, uh, your official plan, although indicating that full services would be the preferred method, not the required, but preferred method of servicing, there is the ability to make exceptions. I'm therefore the opinion that the rezoning application is appropriate. And because of these exception policies containing the official plan consistent with the provincial policy. Uh, as I indicated, uh, Mr. Mr. Van Mayor, Horn, Robert, you got one more minute, please. Thank you. Uh, as I indicated, both Mr. Sepruska and George Hubbard are available to also uh, um, speak to you on their behalf. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> do you have a do you have a, a formal presentation, or are you just going to speak to us? Uh, Mr. Mayor and members of council, I have some written uh, notes here, and I think uh, Rob uh, Van Porten has covered some of this, but rather than trying to call out the paragraph that uh, uh, he had, I'm just going to read this off and uh, forgive me for repeating some of the things that he mentioned. First of all, can you hear? Yeah, we can hear you. Anyway, as you know, we sent you a written presentation that we submitted prior to receiving the planning reports last week, uh, uh, planning report and recommendations. Now that we are in receipt of that report, we wish to add to our report and address issues therein. Our understanding is that the provincial planning statement is a general statement with recommendations and as such would allow consideration by planning boards in unique situations. You will have noted by now that our issue is septic servicing or rather lack thereof. The planning report has an issue with our not having sanitary sewers. However, when referring to municipal services, a term used in the provincial planning statement is that it is preferred. It does not specify that it is mandatory. In section 1665, partial services are permitted under certain circumstances. Uh, <laughs> In the planning report, references repeated, repeatedly made of a 700 unit subdivision. As Mr. Huppert will later point out, we are realistically talking about a 225 unit subdivision consisting of two phases. The initial development of the subdivision will end 410 meters or 1,345 feet west 
from Mr. Huppert's property and approximately 600 meters or 1,965 feet west of our property. Respectfully, until expansion of additional lots, additional phases is approved, reference to 700 lots would seem premature until traffic issues in regard to a second collector to the subdivision have been resolved. Uh, as to the environment and public health issues, it is common knowledge that the condition, conditions in our area are prime sandy soil, which is preferred for tile beds. With respect to issues regarding the desire for denser infill type of development, our request for partial services would be infilling. We're adding land for, for, for approximately nine houses. The alternative could be one house on each of these properties. We note that the official plan says exceptions may be considered by site-specific amendments to the zoning bylaw, and we believe we met the relevant conditions therein, and I think Rob went through a number of those. I won't repeat those. As noted in the engineering comments, <laughs> West River Road is an urban collector road. The draft plan of subdivision shows approximately 31 lots facing Paris Links Road slash West River Road. Our properties, if also developed to 11 meters, will add 22 more driveways to that road. There would be over 50 new entrances on a collector, urban collector. With the development of our larger lots, that would be reduced significantly. The crux of the matter for us is this, and in conclusion, no evidence has been provided that would alleviate our fears that we, the property owners, within the reasonable time will be able to do anything with our properties. Our rights were removed when the properties were rezoned. There were consequences to us, however, unintentional. As previously documented, Marcus Davidson stated that it could be over 10 years before the easterly phases of the subdivision are developed. And there are no assurances that sewer, sewers will ever come as far as our properties. And I think the, uh, the next paragraph Rob uh, uh, stated. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions to the applicant? No? Okay, uh, I'm George Hufford. I own uh, 73 West River Road. Um, in mid-2016, our lands were zoned R1B. Then the, this allowed development of lands on municipal water and septic system. Uh, when this was voted on by council, some were concerned that the decision would take away our rights to develop. We asked that the amendment to the bylaw for be implemented, giving back our rights. Uh, Paris Grand Estates is a, allowed to connect approximately 225 units in total using Paris Lakes Road as their access. That would cause a traffic chaos. Further development requires a new access to be Grand River Street North on lands not owned by Grand River Estates. Further delays are possible uh, in their plans to continue with their development. We do not have a timeline as to when sanitary sewers would be available in our area. As a Grand River Street North presentation, I spoke with Steve Taylor, a PN was dealing with the Grand River Street study. I asked him what he thought about the proposed lots plan having lots fronting on Paris Links Road. He said that he spoke with the county suggesting that was not a good idea. Um, the, one of the reasons we, I, I have uh, like we can have larger lots is where we want the, the, our neighbors across the road and the south side of Paris Lake Road, West River Road, uh, have large lots and they would like to see large lots on the front side opposite their frontage. And, uh, you know, the we, we are trying to comply with that. That's more important that everybody's happy and the, the community is happy having, uh, uh, you know, similar lot. If they, they don't like to have 
11 meter lots at the front on the, on the street. They, you know, they want big lots. So I guess that's my uh, concern. I've, I've lived on that property for uh, 52 years. So I'm certainly not a, a speculator. Um, I had no intention of uh, flipping it when I bought it. So uh, I, as I get older, it's tougher to manage six acres, cutting grass and that. And I, I don't want to die cutting grass when they, um, not that I'm going to plan on doing it in the next near future. But anyway, that's, uh, I guess, our concerns are that we were sort of, we had the ability to do it in 2016 prior to the zoning, and we um, did, uh, at that time, we didn't do anything. We had no intention of flipping it. So now as we get older, we're, we're uh, realizing that we're, the property is getting too big for us. So I guess that's, I guess, our concerns. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for coming and speaking to us tonight. Is there any questions to the applicant? Councillor Miller first, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have a question for our planning staff, but I, that can come later, but I'll ask the applicants. Um, so to be clear, um, if you're successful, you're willing to put in uh, septic beds, tanks, all that stuff, good stuff. And then uh, whoever moves in, the homeowners would be under the understanding that they would have to hook up to municipal uh, sewage once that, that comes along. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Uh, actually, there, there would be two uh, commitments, uh, two sort of notices on title to the properties that uh, we have to also deal with uh, Duffer and Quarries. They, they would require a, uh, a notice that there, uh, there is a gravel pit yeah. behind it. And plus the septic tank that once uh, sanitary sewers are are built on West River Road, that they, uh, they're mandatory hookup for those lots. Okay, and, and I think you guys know it could be um, two years, it could be 20 years and, and nobody knows for sure. That's right. Um, and just to be, yeah, just to be clear, um, how many, how many uh, houses are we talking about for those two properties in total, how many? Uh, well, I'm, 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 I'm planning uh, six on my property, each one of them a minimum of 31 meters wide and uh, 125 meters deep. Okay. Okay. Eight or nine between the two, though. Yes. Okay. Mr. Mr. Mayor, maybe I could answer yeah. part of that question as well. Uh, clearly, it's a requirement of the official plan that uh, an undertaking must be given that and must be perpetual uh, undertaking. Um, and under a uh, severance process, uh, there would be a requirement for a development agreement. And this development agreement is registered on title uh, and transferable obviously to heirs and successors. That's usually the last, last clause in, in such an agreement. And obviously if it's done by, by way of plan of subdivision, um, you know, the same rule would apply. There is an agreement and which is transferable from one owner owner to the other. Uh, clearly, the official plan is very clear in what is required, and that is that uh, when sewers are available, they must be hooked up uh, and at the total cost of the, uh, oh, and septic systems must be decommissioned, and all that is at the total cost of the, of the then uh, homeowner. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Seeing none, Heather, is there anyone to speak um, from the public? No, nope, no one else. No other questions? Councillor Wheat? It's moved by myself, second by Councillor Pierce. That application is ZDA 7 20, on behalf of George Hubert and Sepo Ruska at 73 and 81 Ross River Road be refused. Any other questions? Everything, Councillor Miller first and then Councillor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I wanted to uh, ask the, 
through you to the planning staff. Uh, two hypothetical questions. First one is, would this development, would you still recommend refusal if there were um, sewers extended to that area? Dan? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Miller, we'd have to take a look at, at what that concept does look like and the merits of that request and that proposal. Uh, at this point, we, we just have the information that's available to us in this form. At, at the end of the day, uh, we are looking at uh, making efficient use of both the land and the infrastructure that's available to us. Okay, I, I, I apologize for the hypothetical, but I'm trying to, because some of these things are relevant, obviously, to this application. Because um, <laughs> my second question is hypothetical as well. Um, was there, did we, did we go and rezone it in 2016? If that's the case, and this application came forward prior to that, would it have gone through? Would, would it still be recommended to be refused or not? Because obviously there was talk in, in some of the letters or the reports about this being rezoned by the county in 2016. Uh, through Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor to Councillor Miller, the previous zoning as, as the, the agent outlined did permit partial services. However, that has since changed. That's no longer the case. So we are reviewing the application under current policy. Okay, thank you, Dan. I'm just I'm have I'm really struggling with the recommendation. I'll be I'll be honest with you. Councillor no, Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I am too. Um, because the other homes along that stretch of West River Road are serviced with water, and they're on septic, and I realize it's a guessing game when the sewers will come, but I, I think if we've allowed others to have severances along that stretch on partial services, we do that in Mount Pleasant. There's only municipal water available in Mount Pleasant. There's no sewers. Point of order, well, can, Mayor, we're not talking about Mount Pleasant. No, I know we're not, Councillor Wheat, but I'm just saying, why have we singled out this particular area and not others? I don't I understand. I don't understand your question, Councillor Gatward. Why? Why? Why do you say? Was that because? Is that because Councillor Wheat interrupted? I'm not sure why I don't understand the question, but could you just make me clear as to what you're saying? I guess I'll reframe my question. Thank you. We allow partial servicing in other areas of the county. Why aren't we allowing it here? Is that a question to staff or just you're throwing it out there yes. for the world for staff? No, that's just staff. Thank you, Dan. Uh, through Mr. Mayor, Councillor Gatwick, uh, the subject lands are located in a primary urban settlement boundary, Paris. Um, just to compare it to another settlement boundary like Mount Pleasant, that is considered a secondary uh, settlement boundary. The criteria is a little bit different. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bell? So when the, if, no, I'm not finished, Mr. Mayor. I just want to All follow right. up. So because we made a change um, in the zoning bylaw, we're not going to allow this. Is that the, the main reason? For you to yeah. staff. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Gatward, the, uh, the, the primary settlement boundaries and the secondary settlement boundaries and hamlets and villages, those are, have all been identified in our official plan, uh, which is which pre-exceeds our current zoning bylaw. 
So these have been in place uh, even with previous zoning bylaw. So then why do we have all those lots along there on partial servicing? Just yeah. historical yeah. historic lot creation. Uh, I, I prior to yeah. prior to it being designated as a primary settlement boundary area. Last question. Thank, Dan, do you want to give Councillor Gatward an answer, please? If you can, uh, through Mr. Mayor, we're simply just reviewing the, the existing policies that we have to work with in today's uh, today's okay. role. Okay, thank you. I think if we all went back without the zoning, uh, Councillor Gatward, we'd all be playing golf there. Uh, Councillor Bell, you had one question before we. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's through you to staff, and it, it relates to the comment Mr. Van Porten made about when we made the zoning bylaw update, we appear to have said that we would hold people's ownership rights whole. Now, at the time we did that zoning bylaw update, I was actually involved in some of it. I do recall that statement being made. I don't know whether we ever committed it to paper. Uh, I think it's an important principle because if that principle exists, then the answer to me is very clear. We should not be refusing this application. So I'd, I'd like to hear from staff whether we have um, in some way memorialized that, that statement. Dan, do you know that? Uh, through Mr. Mayor, I, I don't know that for sure if it is documented anywhere in, in text or within the zoning bylaw. Um, I have heard it been referred to a number of times uh, with new applications. However, as a property owner, they would be uh, they would have rights to appeal a decision that we're necessarily taking rights away uh, through that appeal process through the adoption of the new zoning bylaw. So that would have been the appropriate time to to make their concerns known. Uh, it's not clear that those concerns were made known or that if their concerns are reflected in the zoning bylaw, obviously it's it's been changed. So. Uh, the adoption of the new zoning bylaw, or in any case, official plan or any local planning policies, uh, planning documents, that's the opportunity through the review process, uh, the appropriate time to do so. Councillor Bell, you're satisfied with that? Uh, I guess I have to be, yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, it, it, does seem, it does seem unfair that we took something away from someone um, and they've done nothing to sort of bring that forward. So um, any other questions or concerns before we call the vote? The vote is for refusal. We're clear on the, Councillor Wheat, are you voting? Uh, I will be, but right now I'll speak to it. Thank you. I don't feel that we've taken, I'm supporting the refusal. I don't feel we've taken any rights away. If you think back a couple of years ago, we come up with a little uh, statement called tapping the brakes. If we're, tap if we're tapping the brakes, we just let our foot off to allow potentially seven or eight or nine <clears throat> more lots. We just took our foot off the brake. You're right, you're right, Councillor Wheat. Anyone else have anything to say before we vote? Uh, Councillor Coleman, you haven't spoken yet. Hey, Ms. Mayor, I'm gonna call for a recorded vote when you call for the vote. Thank you. Councillor Gatward, you had one more thing to say? I, I can't hear you, Councillor. You're muted, Joan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, uh, Councillor Coleman just said what I was going to. Thank you. Okay, so Heather, we're going to have a recorded vote. And, okay. the, vote, and the vote is for refusal. All those... In, all those in favor of, of the motion to, ref to refuse. Okay, I'll start with Councillor Coleman. Uh, no. Councillor Gatward? No. Mayor Bailey? Yes. Councillor Wheat? Yes. Councillor McAlpine? Yes. Uh, Councillor Howes? Yes. Councillor Bell? No. Councillor Pierce? No. Councillor Chambers? Yes. Councillor Miller? No. 
Yeah. Okay, so we have a tie vote, which no, means the motion's good. defeated. Um, which means we do have probably about the biggest problem in planning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we need some kind of motion to actually pass in order to address this application this evening. So we need to either have another motion come forward um, to approve or to defer it for further information, or we do need to take some kind of action or we haven't dealt with the application at all. Councillor Gottwey was first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I'll bring forward a motion that application ZBA 07 slash 20 DN received from J.H. Cahoon Engineering on behalf of George Hooper and Sepp Braska, owners of lands described as part lot 27, concession to RP 2R 6784 part one in the geographic former township of South Dumfries County of Brant located at 73 West River and 81 West River Road proposed rezoning from single residential to residential singles with a special exception to permit development on partial services on lots requiring a minimum frontage of 20 meters and a minimum lot area of 1,000 square meters be approved. Seeking a seconder, Councillor Coleman is the seconder. Councillor Miller, you want to speak to it? Just, um, I, I appreciate what actually Councillor Wheat said um, earlier about tapping the brakes. I mean, yeah, we've heard that. And I know that phrase <laughs> annoys some of us, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I just feel like these two longtime citizens of our community who, who've done great work for, for us for over the years um, have been caught up in the shadows of, of these larger developments, like these 700 you know, units on the golf course or whatnot. So I think they've played by the rules for years and years. And uh, I think they're just a victim of, of circumstance right now. So I'm, I'm gonna support the recommendation and, and I hope we get enough votes to, to see it through. Councillor Howes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, I, 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 in, in reference to Councillor Gatward's new motion, I, I would rather see this deferred temporarily while we nail down a little more detail on, on what, what the intentions were in 2016. I've, I've heard three different people um, say that uh, there was an, in, an intention expressed at that time that we were not going to reduce the, uh, the opportunities for these homeowners. But, but I, I'd like to, see, rather than making a decision tonight, I would prefer to see us defer it until we see some clarification of what exactly happened in 2016. Thank you. Councillor Chambers, you had your hand up? No, I didn't. No? Anyone else have anything to say? Councillor McAlpine, please. And then Councillor Wheat. I'm with uh, Steve on this. I'd, I'd like to see it deferred for now. Um, I prefer to see more intensification in the urban development areas because the, um, every large lot that we create takes away from the farmland and the adequate use of the land, the best use of it in the long run. And I think that's what we have to be looking at in this case is the best use of our urban settlement areas. And I don't feel that this is the best use of it if we approve this. Okay, Councillor Wheat. Uh, recorded vote, please. Recorded vote. Uh, okay. So if this if this gets defeated, if, if Councillor Gatward's motion gets defeated, then we'll come back with another one. Mayor Bailey, we can a motion to defer can supersede a recommendation on the table to approve. So we can do if Steve and John want to make a motion to defer, we can put that on the table before we deal with the recommendation to approve. Okay, so we're, Councillor Howes, you're going to do that. Councillor McAlpine, you're prepared to stand behind that? Yes, I am. 
You have the seconder. Okay. Do we vote on that first, Madam Clerk? Yes. Okay. All those in support of the deferral. Oh, I'm sorry, you're recording this. No, I didn't request, I request, not requesting, I recorded on the deferral, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Did you get the hand yep. count there? All those opposed? Motions defeated on a tie vote. Okay, so now we're back to Councilor Gatward's motion. Yep. Motion to That's approve. Recorded. This is, this is recorded. So Councilor Gatward, we're not going to make you repeat that, uh, but it's to it's to take them back to their original zoning. Is that correct? No. It's just to no. approve it. Approve it's, it. to, it's to approve it. It's as written on page three under item um, D. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, page two, item B, like boy, and um, it's the first paragraph, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Okay. To so rezone the subject yep. to allow partial servicing on the lots. And Councillor Miller, you're the seconder on that. Yeah, I was the seconder, but I wanted to comment. Okay. Mr. Just a, a correction to what uh, Councillor uh, McAlpine mentioned, um, huge lots in the town. I don't believe these are these huge lots. Um, if you're on private services, I think you're looking at 3,000 square meters. And I think the ones here where they're looking at about 1,000 square meters. So I think I think they're appropriate size. I don't think we're wasting land as it were. So I just, I just wanted to correct that. Okay, Councillor Coleman, you had something to say? No? Okay. Nope. So the vote is clear. So Councillor Gatward's motion is to approve this. Yes. Not not refuse it. Okay. okay. So I'll call the vote, uh, Councillor Gatward. No, it's Councillor Wheat. Oh, sorry, Councillor Wheat, you asked for this one. No. Uh, Councillor McAlpine. Uh, no. Councillor House. No. Councillor Bell. Yes. Councillor Pierce? Yes. Councillor Chambers? No. Councillor Miller? Uh, just to be clear, we're voting to approve it, so uh, yes. Councillor Coleman? Yes. Councillor Gatward? Yes. Mayor Bailey? No. Okay, I'm, I'm at a complete loss. Um, the only thing I can suggest is we're going to have to consult with the solicitor as to where we go from here then. Consult with I'll, her now? I'll make, this, I'll make a motion, Mr. Mayor. All right, Councillor Wheat. Seeing all councillors were consistent on how they voted, 5-5 five, five tie both times. Um, I'll, re I'll support the recommendation made by Councillor House for a deferral and send it back to staff for another um, crack at it. Can we go back that far? Well, well, I don't know what the other option is. I've been in this situation a couple of times in the past when I was chair of planning. Uh, and I would, if Councillor House still wants to put the deferral up there, I will second it, uh, Stephen. Yeah, thank you. Thank because you, right Councilor. now you're out of stale. And you're going, right. no, you're going nowhere but home when this meeting's over. Uh, Point okay, of order, so Mr. Mayor. We've already voted on a deferral motion, and I'd like to have a clarification from the clerk whether another one is permitted. Um, Heather? We will have to change the motion in some respect. Um, we can refer this motion to be considered at the next full council meeting when all members are in, in attendance, that's probably the next best motion to be put forward. Councilor Chambers, is that, okay, Councilor Chambers wanted to speak first. Yeah, Councilor Chambers. Mr. Mayor, that is, uh, 
the, the way around that is to uh, move a motion to refer the report back to staff uh, for further consideration. Uh, there were a few questions uh, asked that, that could be brought back to the next full planning uh, committee slash council meeting. Uh, and hopefully the, uh, uh, the impasse will be resolved. But uh, I'll move that the uh, uh, report be referred back to the, uh, uh, the application be referred back to uh, staff for further uh, uh, input uh, and uh, to be returned in one cycle. Thank you. And I got a second during Councillor Howes. Any other, Councillor Coleman? We just got a second. Oh, okay. I've got a seconder already with Councillor Howes. Uh, question, Councillor Bell? Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, I'll go right the way back. I, I was not in a mood to uh, refuse this application uh, because I do recall the uh, zoning bylaw statement that we would hold people whole. Uh, if we couldn't defer it, then the next best thing to do was to approve it. I'm okay with not approving it, provided that when we refer it back, we actually get to the bottom of that statement that we did hold people whole because this will come back again at some future time and we need to be clear about the answer. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Everyone's finished. We've got a motion on the floor, it's got a seconder. All those in favor? Opposed? And carried. <coughs> that was that was quite uh, strenuous. Thank, Thank you, you, I think, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. It's been a long day. It was I'll entertaining. <laughs> it was very entertaining. Yeah. Okay, 6C, Dan. Uh, 402 Weir Road, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, planning staff have received a zoning bylaw amendment application from Linda Rod Rawlinson, uh, owner of 402 Weir Road. This application was presented to council in September for information. Uh, it's being recommended that WA 20, WA 2020 uh, be approved for the reasons outlined in the report. So the subject lands are located north of Linden Road contained entirely within the County of Brant, uh, abutting the city of Hamilton limits. Access to the property is gained from a private driveway located within the city of Hamilton boundary, uh, leading to Meisner Road or Weir Road. Subject lands are irregular in shape, having zero meters of frontage along an improved or maintained right of way and a lot area of 21 hectares. The property currently contains an existing dwelling, uh, garage and barn. The subject lands are designated in the County of Brand Official Plan as agricultural land use with a small portion of natural heritage due to the presence of a large woodlot to the north. The subject lands are also zoned agricultural with natural heritage area consistent with what is identified in the official plan mapping. So in order to obtain new building permits for renovations to the existing dwelling and construction of a future pole barn for hay storage, the applicant is requesting to recognize and permit the following relief from zoning bylaw 6116. Relief from section 4.28.1 uh, to recognize the existing lot frontage of eight meters where a minimum of minimum frontage of 20 meters for existing lots of record within the agricultural uh, zone is permitted or is required. Uh, and relief from section 6.2 to recognize the existing lot area of 21 hectares uh, minimum lot area of 40 hectares for lots within the agricultural zone uh, are required. And relief from section 6.2 to permit a minimum street setback of 10 meters for agricultural related structures where a minimum of 25 meters is required. Uh, as previously mentioned, access uh, to the property is gained from the private driveway located within the city of Hamilton boundary. Uh, the city of Hamilton was uh, circulated on this application with no comments received. Uh, approval of this application will not result in the creation or ability to facilitate the creation of a new lot. Based on review of the application or applicable planning policy, uh, planning staff are of the opinion that this request to recognize existing conditions as it relates to lot frontage 
area and to permit a reduced street setback for the construction of the agricultural related structure at 402 Weir Road is appropriate and will enable continued maintenance, expansion, and protection of agricultural uses. And for these reasons, planning staff are recommending approval of application ZBA 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll declare the public meeting open. On, and Heather, is there anyone here to speak to the application or the rezoning? No, there's no one on behalf of the agents or the public. Do you have any questions to staff? Anyone have any questions for Dan? Seeing none, Councillor House. Oh, I'll, I'll first of all close the public meeting and then I'll ask Councillor House to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor McAlpine that application ZBA 20 slash 20 slash DN from Linda Rawlinson for property located at 402 Weir Road be approved as outlined in staff report RPT 20 203. Everyone's clear. No questions. Call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And carried. Thank you. 6D. Dan, it's you again. It's your night, Dan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Staff have received a plan of subdivision red line uh, request and zoning bylaw amendment application from MHBC planning on behalf of the owners of uh, N44 Rest Acres Road, otherwise known as. Uh, Arlington Meadows subdivision. This application was presented to Council in August for information purposes. It's being recommended that the red line revisions associated with plan of subdivision application PS209 uh, MD and related zoning application um, ZBA1620 MD be approved for the reasons outlined in the report. Uh, the, sub, the, the property is situated on the west side of Rest Acres Road, south of Arlington Parkway. The lands were previously draft approved as part of the plan of subdivision uh, application PS209 MD and are known as the Arlington Meadows subdivision. Uh, the subject lands were previously subject to a zoning bylaw amendment application. ZBA 31-19, which requested red line of revisions to the approved draft plan subdivision and associate zoning changes. The previous application also included a request to permit an increased maximum building height beyond the 20 meters currently permitted within the uh, residential mul multiple high density um, special exemption three or RM3-3 zone, which currently, uh, which was ultimately refused by council uh, this application is a new application that has been submitted by the, submitted by the applicants, uh, which no longer includes this request for additional building height within that RM3-3 zone. So the revisions associated with the application, with the plan of subdivision application, are required as it was determined that the southern property line located along the west, uh, located west of Rest Acres Road and abutting the proposed scenic ridge subdivision was incorrectly delineated on the approved draft plan. <coughs> the red line revisions uh, correct the boundary delineation resulting in minor modifications to the interior road network uh, and lot and block layout. The previously accepted draft conditions remain unchanged. The zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 16-20 is required as a result of the changes to the draft plan of subdivision layout modifications uh, so the, the modifications have required um, changes to the zone classification boundaries uh, to reflect the greater changes in the layout in the lots and the blocks. Uh, notice of this public hearing was circulated with sign posted as required by the Planning Act with no public comments received. Based on review of the, app, the applicable planning policy, the planning staff are of the opinion that the requested red line revision and associated modifications to the zoning classification boundaries are appropriate for the development of block 176. Planning staff are recommending approval of both uh, rezoning applications of BA 16-20 and the red line revisions associated with plan of subdivision application PS209MD. Thanks, Thank Dan. You. 
At this point, I'll declare the public meeting open. And Heather, is there someone here to speak to the application? Yes, Pierre from MHBC is here on behalf of the agent. Hello, Pierre. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council. My name is Pierre Chauvin with MHBC Planning. I did have a presentation prepared, but I think many of you are quite familiar with the application by now. This is what I call round two of this application. Um, we heard uh, from the very uh, the first go at it uh, quite loudly and clearly from residents and, and council uh, regarding the proposal. Uh, this application does not change as uh, staff have noted the building height or density of the particular multiple block, which was a, a source of contention last go around. Uh, this application is solely dealing with the modifications that are necessary to deal with this boundary uh, issue. Uh, that was a surveying error from the very beginning. So we do need to deal with this. Um, and uh, it, we certainly are in support of the staff recommendation and uh, we ask that uh, council do the same. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, council may have. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for you. Ooh, got some major background there. Um, just a, a quick question. The last time you were in um, and with the, the revised plans for the, you know, the, the, the height of the seven story and that type of thing, I had made the statement to you, you know, will you be looking into potentially underground parking with this? And you, you kind of, you didn't say yes, or you didn't say no. I'm just trying to understand, was there any further thought given to underground parking for this building rather than having it all, um, you know, a, a huge parking lot to house all those vehicles? Right. Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, uh, It'll like, I can't, again, we don't have a, a definitive plan that's before the subject to site plan ultimately, but uh, given the size of this block now, uh, it is highly likely there will need to be uh, underground parking. That's just uh, from my opinion, I can't, I'm not, I can't speak for our client in terms of their ultimate intentions with this block, but just if they want to achieve the density that is anticipated for this block, it's all in all likelihood that there may be underground parking. That'd be very good. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? No? See none. Heather, is there anyone here from the public? No, no one here. No one here? No, no more questions for Pierre? Seeing none. Councillor Chambers. Oh, let, let's let's declare the public meeting closed. And now, Councillor Chambers, please. Moved by myself and second by Councillor uh, Coleman that the application PS2 uh, slash 09 MD and ZBA 16 slash 20 slash MD from Granville for a property located at uh, 1044 Rest Acres Road be approved as outlined in report RPT 2202. Everyone's clear. No more questions. Councillor Bell, you have a question? I do have a question or a comment if I'm allowed to make that morning, Mr. Mayor. You are. I, I was surprised that there was no public comment. Um, it, it, this has been subject to public comments all the time I've been on, on council. But what, what I would like to just reflect on, so for people listening in tonight, uh, that this is a development that has yet to really get going, of course, but it will be another 735 to 878 homes. And I'm not sure that message is in the minds of people in Paris, but I just wanted to remind them. Thank you. Any other comments or concerns? Seeing them, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? It carried. Thank you. Staff report 7A. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Michelle? We have a presentation. Nope, nope. What?
is this one. I got this one. Yep. You're muted. There you go. Uh, there you go. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hi. Uh, good evening. I'm Michelle Schaefel. I'm the environmental planner for the county. And tonight I am pleased to provide a presentation on the review of the tree conservation bylaw. Next slide. Uh, so the purpose of tonight is it's an information report. I'd like to emphasize that staff are not recommending any decisions at this point. Uh, the purpose is to present information that we've heard through consultation and provide present draft bylaws for discussion and uh, receive feedback. Uh, thank you. Uh, next slide. So in terms, I'd like to start with a background. So in March 2018, the Trees Conservation Committee recommended that staff undertake a comprehensive review of the tree conservation bylaw. The current bylaw was passed in 2007, and as part of any bylaw, it's good practice uh, to review the bylaw to ensure it's in line with current practices. And one of those is uh, promoting good forestry practices. So it's the current bylaw promoting good forestry practices. And currently it allows circumference limit harvesting, which allows the removal of the biggest and the best trees. So one of the goals as part of the review is looking at that. Uh, in addition to that, determining should we be regulating trees outside of natural areas, so individual trees and settlement areas, as well as creating a more transparent and efficient review process. As part of the success of any bylaw, it's important to have community support and have a bylaw that's supported by the community. In July of this year, we launched an online engagement tool and we had a website dedicated to the website with surveys and discussion papers. As part of that review, we received over 200 responses. Uh, in addition, we've worked internally with staff, uh, mostly with the bylaw department. We've consulted with government agencies and local stakeholders, such as the Brant Woodlot Owners Association and the Brant County Federation of Agriculture. We've re received a lot of great feedback throughout this process, and I would like to thank those that have participated. Next slide. Uh, in terms of what we heard from the public, at the beginning of this process, I thought we'd have a range of opinions from it's my pro private property and we shouldn't be regulating trees uh, towards environmental protection. And I really didn't see that. I really saw that uh, general support for better protection of trees and the benefits that trees provide in terms of climate change and aesthetics and just uh, the mental health of people. Uh, in terms of the current tree by a lot, it was felt that it isn't providing adequate protection of trees. Uh, the best way to protect trees is through good conservation policies, such as the official plan or tree bylaw. Uh, in addition, we received a number of comments on that the county having tree planting programs to help improve the canopy. Uh, I did reach out to a number of foresters on the draft bylaws and one of the key recommendations that there be two separate bylaws. One bylaw to regulate trees in natural areas and one for individual trees. Uh, in terms of good forage, forestry practices, there was wide support from government agencies, the public, as well as stakeholders. Uh, so looking at the long-term health of the forest in terms of the economy, as well as environmental protection, uh, it was clear that clear cutting is not considered good forestry practices and it does not support it. Uh, in terms of the trees within our natural areas and adjacent to them, there is wide, recogni wide recognition to protect these trees. Uh, as well as to regulate them. As part of consultation with the Brant County Federation of Agriculture, there were some suggestions in terms of looking at the County of Wellington and providing for the removal of hedgerows uh, that are less than 30 meters, as well as the removal of young successional fields. So fields that are less than 10 years old, they've become overgrown. Uh, as well as they suggested using a blanket exemption of up to 20 trees in a calendar year. So uh, to allow for heating homes or building permits uh, or for a limited amount of income. Uh, in terms of the comments that we did receive, many of the public did express concerns about tree removal as part of development. And one of the benefits of a tree bylaw is that it 
can control that removal in advance of a Planning Act application. Next slide. So based on the feedback that staff received, we drafted two bylaws. Uh, the first is good forestry practices draft bylaw. So basically, it's an overhaul of the existing bylaw to regulate trees within our natural areas and adjacent to them, including woodlands, wetlands, or areas next to streams. Uh, we will continue with the notice of intent to cut. Uh, however, in terms of this, we would be looking at good forestry practices, having a silviculture prescription submitted by a registered forester. So it would basically be in a matter of making sure that the application is complete, the applicant is notifying the county, and it should really be a streamlined process. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, we have, I have proposed a blanket exemption of 20 trees in a calendar year. So if somebody needs to remove trees in association with a building permit, the trees are diseased, or for a reason that they feel that they need to remove the tree, we would have this exemption to allow for some removal without a permit. Uh, there are other exemptions that relate to hazardous trees uh, subject to an arborist report, as well as trees in hedgerows, nurseries, uh, orchards, uh, as well as trees that could cause structural damage to building our structure. Uh, in terms of building permit process, staff have not recommended an exemption beyond the 20 trees or the exemptions already provided. Uh, however, an owner, if they would like to remove trees that isn't in accordance with good forestry practices, such as a limited amount of clear cutting, they could apply for a clear cutting permit. And depending on the extent of features proposed, uh, either an environmental impact study would be requ required uh, to assess impacts or an ecological management plan, which would look at protecting trees currently on site, or perhaps uh, we have recommended that replacement trees be required where they are removed or that money be put towards a county replacement tree planning fund. In terms of the review, it's recommended that it be delegated to staff to streamline the process. Uh, if an applicant was not satisfied with the decision of staff, they could appeal the decision or a condition to council or a committee of council. Next slide. Uh, in addition to uh, regulating trees in natural areas, we also did decided to look at, should we be regulating trees in settlement areas? So individual trees that aren't within a woodland. Uh, at this time, it's not proposed to regulate individual trees in agriculture rural areas. It is proposed to regulate trees uh, that coincide with settlement areas in the official plan, as well as the hamlets and villages. And the reason being is that the mature trees, the tree-lined streets within our rural and urban settlement areas, it's felt that they really contribute to the character of the beauty of these areas. Uh, so that is one of the recommendations. Uh, in terms of when a permit would be required, it's recommended when there are mature trees with a diameter of over 40 centimeters or greater that a permit be required. Uh, I've also added where I guess when we're where we're dealing with medium sized trees with a diameter between 20 and 40 centimeters if they are in the front or the exterior yard uh, that a permit be required and in looking at that the intent is to preserve the character of tree line streets and since zoning doesn't permit building in these areas I felt that it wouldn't it shouldn't be adding restrictions onto property owners. In terms of where you do have a medium sized tree, if it's in the rear yard or it's not within the front yard, I have proposed that a limited amount of trees be allowed to be removed without a permit within a year. So on a lot of 0.25 hectares, allow two trees without a permit. So that allows that if they want to do building permit or whatever reason a tree is diseased, uh, the owner could pursue to remove the tree without a permit. Uh, similar to the good forestry practices, a number of exemptions have been provided, such as for hazardous trees. Uh, an exemption is not proposed in association with a building permit uh, beyond the above provisions. And where trees are removed, it's recommended that replacement trees be required or money towards a replacement tree planting fund. Uh, it's not anticipated that these provisions would have a major impact on private owners as uh, the majority of 
people probably don't remove trees within their property uh, and likely not more than two within a calendar year. And again, similar to good forestry practices, it's recommended that the review, review be delegated to staff and appeals could be made to council or committee. Uh, next slide. Uh, so in terms of next steps, uh, we are looking for feedback and we're looking forward to feedback today as a result of the draft bylaws and staff will then take that, consider the feedback, finalize the draft bylaws and re return to council with a recommendation report. And we do have staff from bylaw as well here uh, to answer any questions and I would be happy to as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your report. It's nice to see we have people in the county protecting the trees, doing the right things for the trees. Um, Councillor Miller, do you want to do the resolution first and then we'll have questions? Yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> um, let me just find it. Uh, moved by myself, second by Councillor Wheat. That's staff report RPT 20 124 pre conservation bylaw review, feedback summary report, and draft bylaw directions be approved as presented. Are there any questions to staff regarding trees and the preservation of trees? Councillor Gatward? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I just want to be clear through you to the planner. Um, two trees, how, how large, first of all, is 0.2 of a hectare? How large a lot? Is that a half acre lot or a third of an acre? I'm not very good with hectares and I would expect a lot of people that are watching maybe don't know what size lot that is either. So get your calculator out there. <laughs> half an acre. Half an acre, Councillor Gatward. So if you have a half an acre, you could remove two trees if you needed to. Most people like trees, they don't remove them just for fun. So but if you had to, you could remove two trees. Like we're into the winter season and we get an ice storm and a huge tree limb cracks and you don't think the tree's safe anymore. You can cut it down without a permit. That's what it says here, right? And I just wanna be clear about that because our weather's changing. The other thing I wanted to mention to the planner on page 433 of our package or section um, and four, 432 also. Um, settlement area boundaries in the definitions on that page. Um, you listed the sec secondary urban settlement areas of Burford, Mount Pleasant slash Tula Heights. Tula Heights is now in the city so that should be removed. And um, then under Hamlets and Villages, it, you've listed Birch, Brant Mill Road, uh, and Jenkins Road. Jenkins Road has never been designated as a Hamlet, as far as I know. So I, I would ask that that be checked. Um, and then I noticed on the list that we've missed Langford, the community of Langford um, and Newport. Um, and then the, the last line on that same page says tree means any species of woody perennial plant, including the root system. Um, Manitoba maples are considered a weed tree um, in my mind. And the Ontario Invasive Plant Council uh, lists Manitoba maples, or some people call them soft maples, as invasive species of trees. They grow like wildfire, places where you don't want them. So they're not covered under this bylaw because I think I read in here where 
invasive species are exempt. So then why does it say any species of woody perennial plant? I guess that was confusing to me. Can someone answer that? What was your question? Uh, through you, Mayor, to Councillor Gatward. So in terms of the number of questions, just to clarify in terms of the exemptions, uh, if there was a mature tree with a diameter of 40 centimeters wide or about 16 inches, a permit would be required in the settlement areas. Uh, if it's within the front yard or exterior yard for a medium sized tree between 20 and 40 centimeters, a permit would also be required. So basically a permit would not be required if the tree is less than 40 centimeters wide, uh, or if it's a medium sized tree that's located within the rear yard or beyond the front yard. Uh, hopefully that clarifies that. Uh, in terms of the settlement, even if, sorry, yes. even if it was a hazardous tree that was damaged in a storm, you'd have to come in and get a permit. Oh, no, sorry. So there are a number of exemptions, and one of the exemptions is for hazardous trees uh, that <laughs> are a threat to life and property. And basically, either prior to the removal or within 72 hours, it's proposed that they follow up with an arborist report. And that's just to ensure that that tree was actually uh, a hazardous tree so that the it is a misuse, that provision. Oh, I don't know if I agree with that. Because you might have it all cut up by 72 hours. Mr. Mayor, can I just uh, rise on a point of order? Yep, Council Chamber. I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering, due to the the hour, it's it's we've got a lot of the meeting uh, left to go. I'm wondering if comments could not be uh, forwarded to the uh, author of the report uh, through email, uh, and perhaps uh, uh, many of the questions Councilor Gatwood has, uh, and, and perhaps is not even asked yet, uh, could be answered that way in order to move the uh, meeting along. If we all have questions. Uh, of, of a similar manner, which I have a couple myself, uh, you know, the, the, the meeting will go beyond the, the time frame, and, and I think it'd be more productive for everybody's time if uh, perhaps we uh, passed on our questions and comments in, in written form, uh, because the resolution does indicate that a report is coming back after receiving uh, the, the reports. Just a thank suggestion. You. Thank you, Councillor Chambers. Are you okay with that, Councillor Gatward? Thank you. Um, call the vote to receive the report. Oh, Councillor Pierce. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, on that note, can we, um, I'm not sure if they want to, if people just want to forward them directly to staff or, or copy the councillors mm -hmm. in it so we understand what questions have been asked so we don't re-ask the same question. Yeah, if staff could could make sure that we have a copy for, for council, please. Any questions that come forward after tonight's meeting? That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Call the vote to receive the report, please. All those in favor? Opposed, thank you for your work on the trees. Of uh, 7B, please, who's going to speak to that? Jen and Brandon, you're here to just answer questions. If so, I'll call on Councillor Pierce. Oh, Councillor. Th yep, Councilor thank you. Councillor House first, please. Councilor House. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question to staff, but I can do it after Pierce's, whatever is the right way to do it. All right, Councilor Pierce, if you want to do your resolution, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you, moved by myself and seconded by Councilor Bell that the staff report RPT-20-216, the new official plan summary of public engagement comments be received as information. Thank you. And then Councilor House, you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, Jennifer uh, and or Brandon. Um, first, thank you for this report. It, this There's a lot of great information in this. And um, I, I know a number of people in our communities who, who uh, share these same types of questions and maybe didn't have a chance to attend the, the town halls. Or, or, um, 
so my question is, uh, what's the best way for any of us to direct people to these questions and answers without sharing with them 527 pages of our council agenda this week? Brandon? Fair question. Good evening, everyone. Uh, through you, Mayor Bailey, to Councillor House. Um, so we are actually working on kind of a truncated version of, of that Q&A summary, um, and it will be a working version of the summary. So as we release more information and we receive more questions, we'll be adding to that. Um, but we're just working on making an accessible version right now, a bit easier to sift through for people because there is a lot of information in even just the Q&A summary. Um, but in the next few days, we'll see that available on the website. We can definitely share the link um, with council and it'll be posted on our Facebook page as well. Uh, so Thank there is you. a lot more information coming. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pierce, please. Uh, th <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to, to add to what Councillor Howes was saying, yeah, there's some fantastic information in there. And what I got out of the report was the fact of just if we look at the number of questions that were asked, that to me shows that there's been engagement by the public. And I think that was the whole rationale um, that was being driven by this thing is to get public input. So I would like to say thank you to everybody that uh, that put these questions in because that proves to us that uh, you want to be engaged and you are engaged and that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the presenters. It is indeed a very good report. Uh, just to pick up that last point from uh, Councillor Pierce, uh, lots of questions, but if you look at the uh, source of those questions, in, in some respects, we're getting too many questions relative to population from Paris and too few questions, too, few, too little input from people outside of Paris. I don't know quite how to resolve that. I, I just look to my council colleagues in, in non-Paris wards to to try and push along the, the message that we need to get their input as well. This is not a Paris official plan, this is a county official plan. And the more we can get the input from people outside of Paris, the better the, the plan will be. Uh, and, and that actually brings me to another point that there's the recurrent theme about the uh, loss of agricultural land. I mean, this has been a constant theme. And I would like that we get some hard data, and I pass that request to Jennifer, that. that can we get a, a view on how much agricultural land we have, we have, how much we've used in the last 10 years with a lot of development, and how much we would forecast to, to lose if we met our forecast targets to 2051. My guess is it won't make much of a difference to the total land use, but it, it's important because a, not, a lot of people have actually expressed their objections to uh, new non-farm rural residential lots. And I think that the two things are very closely connected. Thank you. Thank you. So there you go. When you if you have nothing else to do, you two, you can get those numbers together for us, get your measuring tapes out, and find out how much land we have left. That'd be great. It's actually, it would be a very interesting thing to know. Thank you for bringing that forward. Uh, let's call the vote to receive the report. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you for your work. Uh, 7C, please. Mr. Bradley. Councillor Bell, you have a resolution? Yeah, drive safe. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Wheat. The staff report RPT 20 213, interim Paris growth management strategy be approved. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions for Mr. Bradley? Michael, do you have anything to add to your report? Through you, Mr. Mayor, no, I don't. And uh, Matt and I worked on it together. We're both available for questions, uh, most of them probably to Matt, so. Thank you. Any questions for Matt or for Michael? Seeing none, call the vote to receive. All those in favor? Opposed, carried. Thank you, Michael and Matt. 7D, Councillor Howes, you have that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Pierce, that staff report RPT 20-213, uh, Interim Paris Growth Management Strategy be approved. Any questions, concerns? Councillor Pierce, please. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, just one question I have here in regards to the actual building itself. Um, why are we waiting so long to, to rip it down? Mr. Bradley? Thank you, Your Worship. And, and through you, just to maybe clarify, I think Councillor Howes read the resolution from the last report. Yeah, sorry. Just, just oh, so everyone understands that, maybe we can uh, have him read oh. out the resolution once we're done with questions again. Oh, you did too. I did. I'm sorry about that. Do you want, do you want me to do it again right now? Uh, Probably. No, I think, I, I think we're okay until Michael explains the, the plan. Okay, thank you. Through you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Uh, my proposal is that we would commence with de demolition in October. We need about a five month planning period to uh, to get the building ready for demolition. And the bulk of that is around um, designated substances. So the building has, we know it has asbestos, it may have other uh, substances. And that's a fairly complex process to identify inventory and obtain the approvals to, uh, to dispose of. So um, that five months would pull us into what I would call the tourism window in, um, in, in, in the summertime downtown Paris. And I don't think we wanna have a building de demolition going on during that period. So my proposal is that we would then just wait and, and start it in October when the tourism window, the tourism period winds down, uh, downtown is a bit quieter. And, um, and, and I think it would be a, a smoother project based on that timeline. If council wants to move more aggressively on it, we can do that, but it would be tough for us to have the wrecking ball swinging for lack of a better term much before May of, uh, of this coming year. Uh, Councillor House, okay. please first. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the CAO. Um, uh, Michael, thank you for, for putting this together so uh, rapidly uh, because uh, the sooner we can gain an additional 45 plus parking spots in downtown Paris, the better. Um, Presume, and I'm, I, I, I guess this report refers to uh, immediately, and and I guess maybe um, I'm, I'm curious to exactly how immediate is immediately, and more importantly, I anticipate, like presumably, we will put some signage on the site that lets the public know that this is now a municipal parking lot. I would, I would like to request that that same signage um, include an acknowledgement that this is the future home of the Paris main branch library and community hub. So again, so the public sees that there's a commitment, there's a plan for this project, and it, 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 may, uh, it may help to make some of the speculation go away. Uh, I, I'm just wondering if, if there's support for that. Uh, if, if that's an easy ask. Michael? Sure, certainly, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you. And first of all, Mr. Mayor, I, sh I should mention, I recognize this is a planning meeting and I pushed this, uh, this pro report onto it because with the parking lot about to be vacant, there's lots of interest in parking there and we wanna be in a position to enforce it. So that's the reason I, I pushed this forward, maybe a little out of sequence. So uh, I, I hope council, I have council's blessing on that. Um, in terms of the questions, we would be putting up signage. So we hope to see OPP out of there completely by the end of this week. And then we would be moving and putting the signage up next week, uh, probably Monday. Um, in terms of putting some other signage up to acknowledge the future use of the, the property, I think personally, I think that's a good idea because it does help to answer the questions about well, what's gonna happen with, 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 the, with the project. So I think that may be a little bigger of a sign and we could certainly work on that and get that in installed quickly if that was council's wish. Uh, do I need, Mr. Mayor, do I need yep. to make a motion on that one? Um, probably. I think there's still a couple of people that want to speak, though, before we do that. Councillor Gatwood's first, followed by Councillor Wheat. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my question is, are we going to salvage any of the good materials from the building, such as the expensive bulletproof glass that was installed only a few years ago when the renovations were done. Mr. Bradley. Uh, thank you, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Not, I don't believe we would be salvaging anything other than what's movable in the building, any, any fixtures or fixed assets, walls, glass, things like that. 
how it works is when we put it out for for tender to to demolish the demolition company they would be basing their their price on you know what's 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 waste and what can they repurpose and so usually we, we get good prices it's a lot of work and you don't really pay a lot you know given the, the scope of work for demolition because there's a lot of reused materials in there for us to go in there and try to take that stuff out salvage it and find a new use for it it's, it's not it's not efficient it's a very costly way of, of of getting some glass or some 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 other materials so that that's we we would be taking the movable assets out anything that we think we could salvage and repurpose everything else would be just uh just just put over to the demolition company and they would salvage what they could so thank you michael thank you thank you councillor wheat please yeah I, i'm in support of this recommendation to uh make that municipal parking lot and um, eventually take down the existing building there. I'd be a little bit reluctant at this time to put up a sign that says it's going to be the new Paris library because a lot of things can change over the next year. And I wouldn't want to commit that that's going to be a library, something <laughs> you could change that rather than get yourself backed into a corner. But I support the, the parking lot and I support the demolition of the building because there's a lot of unknowns what you might run into in that building. Uh, my own experience here with the addition that happened to the arena in St. George, South Dunbridge Community Center, um, there was a lot of unknowns when they started to, to add that, that you didn't know what was behind that wall until you got that wall down. So be a little bit careful what you want to say that it's definitely going to be a, a library because down the road it might not be thank you councillor we councillor coleman has something to say first and then we'll thank you mr mayor and, and I, I support the report um uh, fully i uh, like the idea of more parking for downtown paris and then when the building is down uh but i'm i'm a little bit like councillor wheat i'm a little spectacle of of <laughs> of uh, committing something yet i would like to see is that we're going to need all the parking in downtown paris when grand river street gets tore up and i don't see nothing for a few years yet and uh, so i would like to see is that you know some planning going this or whatnot and, and where we're going to go so i support it but i have reservations of putting signs up and until we know where we're all going thank you Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Uh, Councillor Howes, please. You're um, muted. There th you go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and just in response to the last two councillors' comments, I I would like to respect respectfully point out that we as a council have <laughs> have committed to that location being the future of the new Paris Main Branch Library, and I think it would I I, I you know, we all know that in life things can change, but we do have a plan in place and the plan is for the library main branch to be in that location. I think it would be uh, a gesture of good faith uh, to both the community and to the library board um, for us to, uh, to to show that commitment on a sign, which which again might uh, might minimize some of the speculation and some of the land speculation that that could ensue regarding that property so i mr mayor i'd like the opportunity to to make a separate motion specific to that and see how the votes land okay let, let's have you <clears throat> excuse me repeat your resolution first of all sure or seven Larry. yeah yeah i'll fix i'll fix the main one first all right thank you thank you uh moved by myself seconded by Councillor pierce that uh, staff report staff report RPT-20-228 interim plan for 28 to 32 Mechanic Street former OPP detachment headquarters uh, be received uh, and approved. Okay, and now you can make your motion for the signage, and then we'll vote on both. Oh, okay, so. Um, I, I, I am looking for a seconder on this, but I move that we, uh, when we do set up the, the parking lot for, as, as a municipal parking lot, that we do add the signage as detailed previously. Okay, so I guess we have to do, Councillor Bell? 
Yeah, I'll second that motion and just to say a few words to it. In our report tonight, we do actually state that the long term plan is to house a main branch of the county of Brant library on this side. So we're not, there's no secret about it. Let's just use that and move forward. Councilor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm requesting that we vote on the, the report um, separately from Councillor Howe's last motion. All right, let's vote on that to receive the report first. All those in favor? Thank you, no one's opposed. And now we're gonna vote on Councillor Howe's. He has a seconder in, in Councillor. Councillor no. Gatward, you're seconding it? No, he had a he had a seconder in Councillor Bell. I'd like to speak to it, Mr. Mayor. Okay, now so that it's on the floor. Councillor Bell is a seconder. Councillor Gatward wants to speak to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um I I have as Councillor Bell just said, it's no secret because it's part of the report. However, um, I'm sure all council members know about that property and the river and the problems that have been in the basement. And when that building is demolished, and the basement is gone. I'm concerned about what could happen. And it is a floodplain. So I wasn't kidding when I said to the librarian at one of our meetings, don't put books in the basement. So, I mean, we live or the site is right beside a river. Um, so I have concerns, that's all. And Councillor Wheat's absolutely right. You never know what could happen. So thank you. that's all my comment. Thank you, Councillor Howes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just in, in response to that, um, I, I think that's a fair argument and that that argument would have been reasonable when we had the meeting to approve selecting this location for the new Paris branch library. I did that, say that. Right, but but we did make a decision that night. Oh, yeah. Right. You did. Take, take, taking your expressed concern into consideration. So I think what you're bringing to the table right now isn't new. Um, so I, I stand by my, my motion. Thank you. Councillor Pierce. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just quickly, regardless of what the issues are with this particular building, there are houses and other buildings in that very near vicinity who don't have water issues in the basement. So my suggestion would be this is strictly for that building. So when it is gone, we're talking a, a net new building here where there will be no issues with it. Let's move on and call the vote, please. Thank you. Councillor House has it on the floor, seconded by Councillor Bell, Councillor Shabers, you want to speak to it once before we vote? I was just going to say the decision on the location has already been made as Councillor Howes has suggested. And I, I know we don't want uh, books in the basement, but we don't want books in the attic like we have now. So we sooner we get this uh, library built, the better. Let's get the books out of the attic and put them in the basement if we have to. If, if I could call the vote, please, all those in favor, signage on the parking lot, future home of the library. Thank you. Opposed? Councillor Wheat's opposed. Let the record show. Thank you. Number eight is communications. There are none. Resolutions. Councillor Gatward, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Chambers that the Bill 229, the Protect, Support, and Recover from COVID-19 Act 2020, proposed changes to conservation authorities, permitting, planning, and enforcement powers be approved. The recommendation, that is. 
All right. I don't have any resources. Councilor Chambers, you want to speak to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm just a little confused at, at the resolution. I, I know I've, I've uh, been asked to second it. Uh, the, the, as it's displayed in the uh, uh, on the agenda, there's two res recommendations, two resolutions. Like I'm not just sure exactly what it is. The point I want to make is that the resolution is is I I would expect uh, generated uh, through GRCA, and I'm just wondering we, we should be more uh, broad in, in in terms of our resolution. So I'm suggesting that the the references to GRCA be taken out be taken out of the recommendation or the resolution and a, a generic uh, conservation authorities because I, I'm I'm sure Long Point uh, uh, feels the same way. Conservation Ontario, which is the uh, Association of Conservation Authorities, uh, are would be supportive of this resolution. But this is a GRCA recommendation. And it should be a generic Grant County recommendation on conservation authorities. Uh, there are some things in the uh, uh, the bill that actually makes sense, I think, to uh, uh, some of the Long Point people. Uh, and I think that the the gist of the recommendation should be that uh, consultation with the conservation authorities needs to be made. Uh, and I, I'm not so sure that I, I'm seconding what's printed on the agenda, but I'm uh, seconding a resolution that would uh, 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 support Conservation Ontario's concern as a, uh, a member of Brant County. Yeah, I, I think it's a very good idea. Councilor Gatward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, um, I just want to be clear, Councillor Chambers and members of Council, this is not a Grand River, this recommendation as written is not a Grand River Conservation Authority recommendation or motion. They don't give us motions to pass. It's strictly up to the municipality what we want to pass. Um, and this particular recommendation was passed by another large community within our watershed and was shared with board members to use if we wish to. So rather than reinvent the wheel, I thought it was a good um, recommendation. It, and it's only mentioning at the bottom that we copy, send a copy to the Grand River Conservation Authority. Um, and I mentioned this to the clerk yesterday that the last paragraph should have our three MPPs added as well as those various ministers. But um, actually this was passed by the city of Guelph and um, the reference to GRCA is we can send it to Long Point Conservation Authority as well if Councillor Chambers supports it. But it does okay. mention Council Conservation uh, Authority or Ontario Conservation. Um, a lot of our information that we received at our special board meeting was from Conservation Ontario, as Councillor Chambers mentioned. So. Thank you, Councillor Gatward. Councillor Chambers, are you still in, in, in line to second that? No, I'm not. Now that I've heard Councillor Gatward explain it, 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 let me be specific. The uh, operative clause says this, and a copy of the GRCA authority report be forwarded to the Premier. That's all fine and good, but we're not just GRCA in, in Brant County, we're, we have other conservation authorities uh, as well. What my point is, the resolution that Council Gatter is proposing is GRCA orientated and it should be Brant County orientated. That's, That's right. all I'm saying. I, I agree with the intent of what they're trying to do, but we shouldn't be sending 
GRCA's report from Brant County to the premier, GRCA can do that. We should be sending our own report or our own resolution. That's the point I'm, I'm trying to make, and I'm not trying to argue, but I think we're saying the same thing, but uh, we're, we're going a little bit too far with the resolution. So I'll just throw my second at this point. Okay. Uh, Councillor Howes, you have something to say before we seek another seconder? I guess we need a second, a, a seconder first. I need a new seconder. Councillor Bell, just to get it on the floor, thank you. And um, I, I'm not sure why we can't we can't change the wording and just make it not GRCA specific. I, I'm, I'm not thinking that's a big deal, Councillor Gatward. I, are you finding it a big deal? Yes. You no, are. I, I, I think it's no. I said no. Okay. No, I, I think that it's important. Um, I mean, the Grand River Conservation Authority is the largest conservation authority in the province. However, if Councillor Chambers takes exception to their their report going to the the um, province, we can. Um, we can remove that because I'm sure they're going to get 10 copies of it anyways. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not um, sure that's so what Council, that's not what Councilor Chambers be, said, Councilor Gatward. Just to, yeah, yes, he said he was opposed yeah, just to be clear. To just, that we were asked just to be clear, Councilor Gatward, just to be clear, I am suggesting that GRCA send their report. Brant County can send a Brant County report. They don't have to send GRCA's report. That's all I'm saying. We're agreeing, but we don't need to be carrying GRCA's uh, <clears throat> or suitcase. We can send our own, as the mayor suggesting. That's the only the only problem I have with the resolution. Thank you, Councillor House. Please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just I'm just wondering, given given that dialogue, and I, I support what Councillor Chambers is saying, and I see the 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 strength in it coming from our municipality. Um, I'm just wondering if if everyone would be uh, uh, if it would be acceptable to everyone for for the councillor Gatward's motion to be amended just to to change the wording um, so that then we could all support it and move on yeah I think that's a good idea are you all right with that councillor Gatward yes and that's what I was going to suggest on that last paragraph but I didn't get that far that we can end this um, and take out the part that Councillor Chambers is um, wanting removed and that we forward the rest of our recommendation to um, those officials that are listed. Thank you. And so, we have a second. We have. A, I think that's that's acceptable to everyone. Councillor Bell is the seconder on that. I think Councillor Gatward. We should really call the vote. All those in favor to move forward. Are we voting on the amendment? Or are we voting on the original motion well, as amended let, let, or not amended? Oh my goodness! Let's let's vote on the amendment first. All those in favor of the amendment. And now let's vote on the motion. All those in favor. Motion as including, amended. Motion including, as amended. Three, including our three MPPs. That's great. Three. Holy doodle. Number 10 is other business. And Councillor Gatward, you're the only one up to bat on that one. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you might recall we passed a motion a number of months back that we request a meeting with Sally Johnson from Family and Children's Services. And it was in the newspaper again today on the front page. Um, and so I'm wondering if you've met with Sally yet, because we requested a meeting. And how did that go? Could you report to us on that? Sure, sure. I did meet with her and it went very, very well. Uh, we found out that we know each other from way back when. And uh, I did get an email from her today, and I will send you a copy of the email. In fact, I'll send it to everyone as soon as this meeting's over. 
Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. So that summarizes what happened at the meeting and what her position is. And it, it does, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Number 11, we're going to go in camera. Councillor Coleman, please. Move by myself, second by Councillor McAlpine, that we move into camera, discuss litigation matters from that the lawyer has got presented us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor of moving into camera, please. Thank you. 